go see a staff member and we will try our best to accommodate. To go with the usual housekeeping, I don't need to mention about mobile phones, but we do have emergency exits everywhere around this room. Uh, just look for the green signs and um, follow the staff or the um, event team. The meetup point is exactly um, directly opposite the reception and towards the left of the parking lot. We got bathrooms to the right of me or to your left. And um, just with the weather, just be careful with your feet. Um, with the polished tiles, they can be a little bit slippery. We don't want you to hurt yourselves. At the end of each day, we'll have a quick survey and we'd love to hear your feedback and know your thoughts. And the like all great events, this event couldn't be made today without significant contributions by many, including Ange, Kylie and Brent and the SPA committee, Brett Whelan and Patrick Filippi from the PA Labs at University of Sydney, and our many sponsors, including GRDC as event sponsor, CSBP tonight with our dinner sponsor, and long-term partners, John Deere, Case IH, and new partner, Hardy and Bayer and also our other speaker sponsors such as AgriFuture and exhibitors, Croptimistic, Magro and Access Tech. And with all that noted, I'd like to formally open this symposium and welcome Mr. Hugh Jones, MLA, member for Darling Range to present. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Phil, and uh, thanks everyone for having me here today. Also acknowledge the uh, Wajak people, the Nongar Nation, uh, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I also note the attendance of uh, farmers from across Australia, uh, with the exception of Tasmania, as I understand it. But um, um, welcome to WA, and uh, we've turned on the weather for you. Um, I'm here to represent the Minister for Agriculture, Jackie Jarvis, who's uh, unfortunately, um, uh, for, for you, she's away, uh, but fortunately for a farmer, she's in Indonesia uh, with a premier um, working to try and um, establish uh, new markets and particularly for agriculture in, in Western Australia. So hopefully they'll come back with some um, new contacts and new markets and, and provide more, more um, options for farms in WA and across Australia. Uh, precision agriculture is a rapidly uh, evolving technology and it provides huge potential to improve efficiency and sustainability outcomes for agriculture through a, a paddock uh, mapping and assessment of the yield potential. And I've heard um, a, a fair bit of conversation about uh, yield monitors uh, on headers and other ways uh, that you use science to, um, uh, to, to obtain your data. Uh, Localised weather monitoring and soil mo moisture monitoring, GPS enabled mobile apps, that can track the location and activity of, of your machines on the field, and, and also to monitor maintenance schedules for your vehicles and other, other equipment. And a lot of this technology is not easy to implement. And the, uh, this symposium will create the opportunity to share ideas and learn from peers in, in the industry. I understand that uh, and, and within farming, there's also, um, it's a competitive business. So being able to share um, information between uh, farmers that may be in the same industry, it's, it's very important uh, for the development of, uh, of, of uh, agriculture in, in WA and Australia. Uh, there's rapid development and adaptation of uh, PA technologies uh, to food, produc food production and natural resource management, and the need for uh, food, security and, and food security and the capability to produce more food and fibre from the same land resource is rapidly increasing. PA will contribute to new skills for farmers and help, the, help lift production efficiencies through more accurate application of varying rates of fertilizer and herbicides, uh, precision placement of seed, allowing for reduced inputs to grow the same crop and delivery of cost savings uh, to farm businesses. This contributes to improved stewardship of the land. For example, the ability to monitor vegetation coverage remotely and calculate the risk of soil erosion, enabling early, early remedial action and better application through targeted and reduced quantity of chemicals and fertilizers can allow farmers to reduce their carbon footprint. And of course, um, WA, the WA farmers will, will know uh, that we have inherently low fertility soils. So this will allow farmers to overcome their production limitations and using the new technologies to assist in, in the soil amelioration methods and improved understanding of water penetration 
into different soil types. And uh, of course, real-time monitoring applications uh, will also um, be, allow you to uh, monitor food, uh, sorry, animal welfare as well, which is uh, obviously a topical uh, issue. And also emerging technology for identifying weeds in the paddocks uh, and spot spraying them, uh, which in itself will reduce uh, the, the use of chemicals um, and, uh, and reduce the uh, environmental uh, impacts. The private sector is leading the way uh, with major investment and in technology, but the WA government is the supporter of the Food Agility Cooperative Research Centre, which brokers, designs and delivers innovation programs for the agri-food industry. The WA government supports two uh, agility uh, CRC projects, the Agri Analytics Hub, which offers growers invaluable uh, insight into op optimised inputs, accounting for farm specific soils, landscape and climate variability to improve crop yield, and uh, quality, profit and density, uh, identify opportunities to reduce the emissions. And also WA farm data sharing projects, which allow growers to make more sophisticated whole farm liming decisions using their own farm soil and yield maps. The WA Department of Prime Industries and Regional Development uh, has some research in the space and has developed Extrata, uh, a secure platform for exchange of data. So farmers, agronomists, scientists, advisors, and researchers can maintain the data security whilst cross-referencing cross, cross the data sets. So uh, in closing, I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, join you today and to learn uh, uh, from the presentations and also in speaking to the individual farmers from WA and across Australia. Uh, your innovation and ingenuity are adding value to the sector uh, and as well, it's, a, uh, it's good for you and it's good for WA and good for the country. So thank you very much. Thanks for that, Hugh. Um, yeah, so I'm Patrick Filippi from the University of Sydney in the Precision Ag Laboratory. So I'm gonna chair this first session. Um, most of the talks about 20 minutes apart from the industry updates. So about 15 minutes of speaking. So we're gonna keep some time at the end. Um, so, you know, th uh, for questions. So just think of a few questions as, as you're um, just watching the presentation. So first up, we've got um, Michael Walsh, so former colleague from the University of Sydney, who's now at the University of Western Australia, um, and he's in the Centre for Engineering Innovation. Uh, Michael has a long history in researching, developing, and teaching alternative weed management strategies. He's currently focused on weed recognition technologies and opportunities for precision application of novel weed control technologies. Um, yeah, that's what he's talking about today, really. Novel weed control technologies for Australian cropping. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah, thanks, Patrick, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, so today is um, a little bit of a, a brief look through some of the alternate weed control technologies that are, I guess, very, very recent, I suppose, um, and that I've just may have been focusing on over the last uh, 12 or 18 months. Um, the first two technologies come from Global Neighbour. Uh, they're a company, a startup company based in Ohio. Um, they developed something called Weed Arrays a few years ago, and it's based on the combination of blue wavelength light and in mid-infrared heating. Um, so the uh, the idea is uh, it was developed as a home garden use. Uh, eventually, that's how it was commercialised. Uh, so it's a handheld unit that you place over the weed and you give it about 10 seconds of exposure and it kills the weed. And the idea is limited science in how it actually works, but the thinking is that the, uh, the blue light wavelengths at quite high intensities, 30 times sunlight, damages the... Uh, uh, chlorophyll or chloroplastic structures uh, causing cell degradation and cell collapse. And the, uh, the infrared heating does have some soil penetration activity to potentially target the, the roots. Um, so highly successful as a home garden use, um, but hopefully the company is now interested in developing this for a more broader area use. And so we are working with them to, to explore that opportunity with that technology. 
Um, after some growers in the US heard about the, the weed array system, they approached Global Neighbour to see if they could come up with a harvest weed seed control solution. And so they've subs subsequently been looking at using the same combinations of blue light and heating for targeting weed seeds present in chaff during harvest. Um, so the system here on the screen is their prototype development. So it's got a little hopper uh, and then it's got blue light systems and heating systems alternating along an auger. Um, and as the chaff material passes through, it uh, essentially devitalizes the, the weed seeds. Uh, we've done some preliminary testing and it does work. Um, it does work as a bench top system um, and it works in a, a short enough time to make it a feasible option during harvest. And so it's it's quite a, an appealing alternative to, to what we currently are using. So again, hopefully we'll be able to pursue that a little bit more. We've now got a, a system uh, set up in the, in the lab that we're hopefully get working um, later this week and we'll be able to start going with our testing. Um, so those are the two probably really most exciting ones because there's a lot of science still to be done in trying to understand why these systems work. Um, we know that they, they do work, but uh, it's good to have that understanding of, of why so you can potentially improve them. Um, probably uh, something that most of you are familiar with is electrical weeding. Um, there's a lot of commercial options now available, um, particularly through Europe and the US. Um, a lot of it's focused in the um, organic markets. Um, people are, are struggling for, for weed control in those areas. Uh, they're quite robust systems, very high voltage. Um, they get called lightning weeders for, for a good reason. Um, they, there is selectivity is possible based on weed height. So when you've got weeds taller than the crop, you can actually use the, these weeders to go over the top of the crop to, to target the weed plants. Um, relatively effectively, uh, talking to growers who have used them, though, they say that as the, as the plant height decreases, the efficacy is obviously less because you get closer to the crop and you're worried about losing crop yield. They do act not only just to kill the weeds, but if you don't get complete weed kill, you do get a reduction in seed production. I think I skipped a slide. Oh, no, here we go. So um, in Australia, uh, in Sydney, actually, there's a company called Azeno. Um, they are developing a lower-powered option. So it's a pulsed electric field, um, and it's quite finite in comparison to the, the lightning-type weeders. Um, it delivers high-frequency pulse charges to weed plants, um, and it is actually a non-thermal approach. So the, the larger high voltage systems, they work on weed plants by the resistive heating of the plant as the charge goes through. And essentially the, the plants boil from the inside out. In this system, again, we're not really sure how it works. There's a lot of science to be, be done with this one as well, but um, it is quite effective. The, the little photo there shows um, ryegrass plants that were controlled at the, the 10 leaf stage um, in a few seconds with just 10 to 15 joules of, of energy in total. So it's a, it's a very low energy system, but apparently quite effective. Um, they're progressing to, to field evaluations now. So this is looking at a, a brassica crop. So on the, on the right, my right, um, we can see the untreated. And then on the left is the, the treated row of brassica plants. So just dragging a, a probe across the, the soil surface to to control those, those weed plants. Um, as it says down the bottom there, um, Liam Hescock is the director of the company and he's starting to explore field opportunities. So if anyone's interested in getting involved in this work, then reach out to Liam. He's looking for field trial sites. Um, yeah, site-specific weed control um, is probably not that novel anymore. Um, weed recognition has really allowed this industry to grow quite exponentially over the last five years. Um, most of the major companies now are involved to, to some extent with the, this opportunity, um, but it is still all mostly about herbicides. So it, it's a great um, opportunity to actually specifically target weeds in low density situations but it still is typically relying on herbicides. So we do need 
some non-herbicide options to, to complement this approach. So some additional precision weed control tools are probably a little bit uh, more advanced than the ones I've just been talking about. Um, examples are laser weeding, water jet cutting, uh, microjet sprayers and gametocytes. So firstly, uh, laser weeding, we've been looking at this for a few years now with um, varying levels of success. Uh, we started off with quite low powered systems that were effective if you focused the laser on the plant for a minute, um, which was totally impractical. Um, the the more um, commercially available lasers got incredibly expensive very quickly. Once you started getting up over a hundred volts, um, you're looking at thousands of dollars for a laser system. Um, so the the laser systems that you see on the autonomous robots that are available commercially uh, in the US and elsewhere. Incredibly ex powerful lasers, but also incredibly expensive. Uh, more recently, we've developed a new low cost laser system, about $100 for a module, and it is quite high powered. Um, our preliminary studies have shown that we can quite easily kill three to four leaf weeds, both grasses and broadleafs in a few seconds. Uh, the laser units are, are really quite lightweight, so it makes them flexible, durable, and potentially you could have lots on them on a, uh, a boom type system. Um, they have a, a standard array is a, a 20 mil by 20 mil beam and it's a highly collimated beam. So it doesn't disperse over um, short distance of a, a couple of meters. Um, and so it has got quite a large target area, but it is focusable. So you can use a, a quite cheap, simple Fresnel lens to focus it down to a, a one mil uh, beam if you want a higher intensity and higher energy inputs. Um, so that's that's the system that we're, I guess, most focused on the development at the moment. Uh, the next one is water jet cutting. Um, so water jet cutting systems have been around in industrial uses for many years. They're quite good at cutting through steel um, or masonry or whatever um, you'd like to cut through that's a little bit tough. Um, they're quite precise and quite accurate. As you can see, you can come up with quite ornate cuts um, that can be programmed. Um, in terms of the use in ag, so Aquatil has been using water jet cutting as a liquid coulter uh, for some time now. So high pressure system cuts through stubble, straw um, to allow more accurate seed placement and reduce the, uh, the issues associated with having high residue cover. Um, some of the the preliminary studies that we've done is just looking at the um, the use of this approach for weed control, just identifying the opportunity. So some simple calculations saying if you've got a, a density of five plants per metre squared across a, a field, um, it's only going to take about 20 litres per hectare of water to actually control those weeds using a, a water jet cut. Um, there's, a, there's a few things you can actually do that are quite nice when you've got water. Um, you can combine herbicide with that water to target um, larger plants. Um, the jetticide approach was developed by these guys for targeting return cotton. So return cotton, commonly the most troublesome weed in cotton, um, really difficult to control. So um, by using a combination of the, the water jet and the, the herbicide, you can actually get really good control of return cotton. Okay, um, so gametocides is something that um, I learned about it at Texas, in Texas A&M. Um, they've, um, they've been around for quite some time. They've been used as um, male sterility agents, um, particularly in the, the hybrid seed production industry. Uh, so the idea is that you prevent the pollen formation on one male plant or on a female plant, sorry, and then you allow a, a different line or a different variety to provide the, the pollen to produce that cross. And so the opportunity there is to use this approach for preventing weed seed production. So you pre prevent the pollination of the, the weed plants. Um, there's a variety of chemicals that are used as gametocides. Um, and so that means that there's a, some opportunities to, to look for selectivity uh, for different weed species in different cropping situations. Um, and then if you cannot quite get that chemical selectivity, then through 
precision applications, you can get a, a physical separation and therefore some selectivity with the application on, on specific plants. Um, the microjet sprayers, um, again, not particularly new, um, but comparatively difficult, surprisingly difficult, I guess, to, to really make some headway here. So this is some research out of UC Davis. Um, the little photo there shows the, um, the solenoids with the herbicide tubes coming into the top. Um, the idea is that you have an array that have a very small application area, um, just a, a 10 millimeter resolution area that you can develop a recognition algorithm for. Um, and then this is the, obviously the untreated on the left or my right here. And then on the, the left there is the, the treated afterwards. So potentially can be quite accurate. The the blue dye I use is, is spread a little bit off the, the target, but essentially it's been very accurate. And so it does create the opportunity to not just target plants or plant areas with the conventional sand spray approach, but target plant parts with a microjet herbicide application. Um, typically, there's not a lot of, uh, sorry, you're restricted use of herbicides in this approach at the moment because of formulations. A lot of the formulations are not suitable to this use. So we do need different herbicides, different for herbicide formulations to, to get the best out of, of this particular approach to, to weed control. Right, so there's just a few of the precision type weed control tools that that are being developed, or at least uh, in the initial formula formation of. We need precision weed recognition. Um, typically, at the moment, the industry is very much focused on whole plant recognition, and that makes sense for the sea and, sea and spray approach. But if we want to start getting more precise, then we need to be more accurate with our recognition approach. Um, so this is an example of some work, again, from Texas looking at growing point detection. And so the, the opportunity here is that if you can detect the growing point, then occlusion becomes less of an issue. So if you've got crop shading of weed plants, then as long as you can still see the growing point or you can still detect the growing point, you can still go ahead and apply a treatment. And so the... The photos here show the, the crop weed combinations and then this these lines down here show the accurately detected growing points on the on the weed plants. That can then be potentially targeted with whatever. Um, as occlusion increases, as the crop grows, um, there's less and less of the, the weed plants that you can see. Um, and so then it becomes a, a challenge of, well, what about let's just target pieces of the plant plant leaves, whatever, and then you know, maybe with a microjet approach, you can get enough contact onto those leaves that are still visible, even with 60 to 70% occlusion to affect a weed control treatment. Okay, so um, yeah, lots of new technologies available, a few that have been developed for uh, precision weed control. Um, commercial development of these, though, is still potentially going to be challenging and still a reasonable way off, I believe, but fingers crossed. And with that, thank you. Are there any questions for Michael? I think we've got a roving microphone around, do we? Yep. Yeah, Brent, just in the middle here. Michael, whatever happened to the um, site-specific site tillage equipment you're working on? Um, yeah, so the, the weed chipper, it hasn't disappeared completely. Um, and Andrew Guzami will talk about that uh, tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow morning. Um, and so a bit, and I won't say too much, but it is continuing. We're evolving it to do in-crop work, um, but we've also secured some opportunities for the systems to be tested in the US. Any more questions for Michael? Right. Oh, can I ask you about the blue light one? Did, you have to cover the entire plant with this light. Right? Um, in, for my understanding is the, um, the, sorry, the question was about the blue light. Um, that you, do you need to have to cover the, the whole plant to, to be effective? Um, 
again, little science known about this activity, but I would imagine because it's acting on chlorophyll or chloroplast or light systems that as much of the leaf area as possible would need to be targeted for a quick kill. Uh, would any of these technologies help with the weed seed bank management? Um, yeah, potentially the the combination of blue light, infrared heating would potentially. There, there is some penetration with the infrared heating, but I think it's still only relatively shallow, like a, a couple of centimetres. So maybe in a you know long term no tool system where there hasn't been any disturbance for some time, there's a possibility. Any more questions for Michael? And Dennis up the back. Uh, uh, Michael, um, just wondering um, in the sugarcane industry, there's a lot of well, we can't use green on brown technology. Um, what's happening there with green on green? And like, I know the there is a university up in Townsville that's looking with camera recognition with um, weeds in cane, but is there anything else that's coming up? As we've got a lot of regulations with um, the reef there. Uh, so you're specifically looking for non-chemical weed control in that industry? Was that the... Sort of where you what you're looking uh, for, but basically just to cut back on any either chemical or yeah, just just using using less chemical virtually. So virtually just seeking out weeds in 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 cane. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. Well, I mean, auto weed came from that area, um, and I assume that they're still active there. Um, to be honest, I can't really, I don't really know a lot about what's happening with the development of that technology in sugarcane. I assume it's happening. Um, but yeah, it just depends on market demand, I suppose, of what where the activity is being driven. Cool. All right. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate that. None of the thoughts. I just might. Right, so next up we've got a bit of a, a duo talking. So we've got Bindi as Vista, who's from Agrarian Management. She, she wears a few different hats, but today's Agrarian. And um, Craig Topham as well. So Craig's a consulting agronomist with extensive experience implementing PA management systems here in WA. I mean, Bindi's a, not a precision agriculture specialist, but a decision agriculture specialist, which is nice to hear, with a substantial background in control traffic farming and PA implementation. And today they're going to talk about 10 years of VRT. Where are we now? Thank you. So a couple of months ago, I told Topo that Brett had rung and asked if we'd talk um, about precision ag. And he mentioned to me that in 2013, he gave a talk at the symposium, which I think was the last time it might have been in WA. So we actually thought, what a great opportunity to have a look back on where we were 10 years ago and, and where we've got to now. So that's what we've done. And this is our story. My name is Bindi Vista. I'm a precision ag or decision ag um, consultant for agrarian management. I've been lucky enough to work for, with them for 10 years, uh, five years, sorry. Just doubling, doubling it. Um, and I, I'm lucky because I get to work with people like Topo. So together, um, I'm the one that processes the data and then um, Topo takes it and works with the client to actually make that management decision. So those of you that know us will know that Topo and I do like a good story. So just in case Patrick turns the microphone on us off on us today, um, in a nutshell, where are we um, after 10 years of VRT? Well, Plant available water capacity is still the key driver of yield potential in our northern ag region in Geraldton. Uh, the next one is in 10 years, we've doubled our yield and we've primarily done this through managing soil acidity and compaction on top of improved agronomy. 
And now the future we see is the opportunity to use the historical data that we've been able to collect because these are ongoing challenges to actually help further improve managing our soil acidity and improving our nutrient efficiency. So now I'm going to hand over to Topi, Topo and he's going to tell you where we were 10 years ago. Thanks, Mindy. Yes, yeah, so it was 10 years ago we, uh, I spoke at this conference, I think it was the WACA. And back then we we're just starting our um, journey into – I'll just change. Back then we we're just starting the journey into VRT and precision agriculture. We knew there was variation across the paddock. We had yield maps. We knew a lot about our soil. We knew that planet of other water was a key driver. So we started using all these um, these different layers of information to develop the rate farming system. Now, our JDC project that we did back then, we found we could increase the gross margin by 49 bucks and we increased our return on funds employed by 22%. So 22% greater return on the funds invested in that crop through using VRT. That was 2010, 2013, that project. So as Bindi said, the primary cause was that variability is plan of our um, water capacity. The soil's ability to hold water. So a project paddock we're looking at, out there sand plain, it's yellow sand. Everyone says there's no difference. That's just yellow sand, one side of the paddock to the other. Well, yellow sand and sand's not sand. There's lots of different types of sand. So we worked out there that um, the wood holding capacity ranged from, I think, 67 um, mils a top metre through to 116. Not a huge difference, but enough variability to manage. Now, I used this slide back in 2014 when we did that last presentation. That photo was taken in 2010, November, prior to harvest. The crop was going about 0.6 of a tonne. At 30 centimetres, the soil profile was wet and the crop had died off. So we thought, yeah, we know that this variation in water holding capacity, how do we manage that even more thoroughly? When you see you've got a wet profile and dead crop, there's something wrong with our system. So that's when we started digging a bit deeper. Now we'll go into that a bit more later on. Now we say variable rate, what were we doing? Well, back then we were spending about uh, 140 bucks a hectare on fertilizer. We we're varying our compound, a bit of nitrogen, um, and just basically adjusting our inputs according to the yields that we were getting back then. What are we doing now? So again, that's just a an example of what we're doing. Uh, the interesting point is our fertilizer costs have increased by 250%. Yes, we're putting a little bit more on, but the cost of fertilizers near on, well, well, more than doubled in that period of time. So it's getting very expensive to achieve the same thing. So we're varying our P, we're varying our K, a lot of variation in nitrogen. We're doing a lot of varying variable rate seed work. Um, for non winning sands, it's a very good tool for non winning sands and increasing weed control. Now I'll pass back to Bindi and she'll go through a couple of things we've actually uh, achieved in that time. So we've got seven years of yield maps here. This is over the 14 years, starting back in 2010 um, through to 2022. So it's every wheat year, which is every um, second year. And what I've done is you'll seen the zone map that we, that we zoned up. We've got three zones. We've got a zone one, um, which is the red area that's low yielding. So that's 67 um, plant available water capacity holding soil. A medium zone, which is the green one, um, and that's our um, yeah medium yielding, and then the high zone. And we've actually got three soil test points um, on each of these zones that correspond with those um, plant available water capacity graphs. Now, this farm, we've actually continued monitoring these soil points over that time. So it was actually a really nice opportunity. What I did was we took the average yield around each of these three points for the wheat yield and we've graphed them along here. So along the bottom, we've got year, um, year from 2010 up to 2022. And up here, we've got um, on the y-axis, we've got yield. So what you'll see is um, effectively we've doubled our yield from this um, in the low zone here, we're just under a tonne. And now in 2022, we're just over two tonnes. The medium and the high zones, we've done a similar thing, except um, in 2020, uh, 2010, the average yield was around two tonnes. But now we've gone up to four and, in fact, um, nearly five in 2018. So why? What have we done differently? 
Well, as Topo said, it was about trying to access that moisture um, underneath. And when they did all the soil testing and discovered that we had a soil compaction problem and a soil pH problem. So this farm's actually had very good liming history, but um, before 2003, they'd applied two tonnes of lime. And then over the last 10 years, they've um, applied nine ton about nine tonnes, or I think it's actually eight and a half tonnes to this paddock. So that was done in 2013. And then in 2018, they put out two and a half tonnes of lime and then deep ripped with topsoil slotting down to 50 centimetres. And that's what's given us this huge jump in yield essentially, because we've been able to improve that root access. Um, following that, was, the paddock was actually deep ripped again in 2020, and they applied another three tonnes of lime in 2021. And along the way as well, um, back in 2016 was when the, the farm got fully matched up um, for controlled traffic to try and minimise the recompaction. So with those soil uh, monitoring points, we've gone back and had a look um, historically at what happened. And what we found is that the soil pH is actually improving. So these are the three zones um, that we have, those soil test points, and along the bottom is time or year, and then we've got soil pH. And I've actually put, there's a dashed line across there that are those target um, P soil pHs. So in the top soil, we're aiming for above 5.5 and in the subsoil, we're aiming um, for above 4.8. And what the graphs actually show is that we are getting this increasing pH um, as we've gone along. And now the soil pHs are actually above those target levels for the most part. Um, we've actually got the three depths as well. So the one on the bottom is um, the 20 to 30 centimetres. But something interesting um, that Top and I noticed the other day is that in actual fact, if you look over there at zone one, um, the soil pHs are really quite good at even at depth. Whereas in these high yielding areas in zone two and three, um, they're actually low. In fact, um, the soil test from 2022 shows we've still got a bit of a pH problem in zone two. So Having a look at the correlation between yield and soil pH, in 2010, we had this really nice, um, or a very strong correlation between yield and pH. So where we had um, acidic um, topsoil, we had low yield, and um, we had a higher yield where there was um, a better pH. When we come and have a look at in 2022, we've now got no correlation between um, soil pH and, and yield, which um, is really, in our sands, we can still be high yielding, but have a, have a pH problem. It comes down to that water holding capacity. If we have a look a bit deeper, because uh, in WA, we um, subsoil acidity is a key driver and that's what can limit our roots. In um, This is actually in 2010, 10 to 20, we do have a correlation um, with yield and pH. And in um, down, we actually didn't um, go measure very deep then. Well, wasn't so important. When we have a look at 2022 from 20 to 30, we've actually got a negative correlation between yield and pH, which is, um, yeah, just coming back to again that those high zones, zone one and two, um, we are seeing still high yields pulled off, but lower pHs. Why is that? Well, this is um, the paddock just to the north of this paddock. And this crop here is what you can grow on 120 mils of um, rain for the year on 67 um, millimetre uh, plant available water capacity, which is pretty amazing how far technologies come in in uh, in 10 years. But this paddock, well, this, oh, sorry, the paddock we've been looking at has been um, treated with that deep ripping and topsoil slotting. So these slotting plates bolt behind the tine and they run about 10 centimetres below the topsoil that allows the topsoil to fall in. You can see this um, really nice picture here. So a couple of weeks ago, um, we actually did, dug some soil pits there through part of our DPIRD and GRDC re-engineering project. And we we're actually looking at, well, we're measuring the difference between um, the soil pH and other nutrients on and off these slots. Because what we're seeing is that we're getting more plant roots in these slots. So they're able to grow deeper. This one here has actually been sprayed with the um, pH spray. So um, the sort of darker color, the green down here is good pH. Whereas um, off the slots here is still um, that's a bit of subsoil acidity, 
So if we can essentially turn this slot into topsoil, we can potentially get the plant roots down there. And that's certainly in this low zone, this is what we saw, that the plant roots were deeper under the slot and not so deep um, off the slot unless there were old root channels. In the high yield, though, we had lots of fine roots all the way through the profile, so off the slots as well, um, but there's certainly more roots there. Oh, top eight, we're done. Can't get it to go back. You're going to fix it from there. If I'd said my piece. Right. Um, so we're also seeing that that farm pH is um, improving at a at a um, a farm level too. And this is just some trend graphs. Um, so this farm, we do go back and soil test those same points every um, maybe two or three years, depending on what, what we're looking for um, over the different depths. Now, what does it mean in terms of water use efficiency? Well, we've doubled the yield. We've effectively doubled our water use efficiency. So in um, the low zone, and we've potentially, we've gone from 10 uh, water use efficiency. This is on effective rainfall of 10 um, up to 20 in 2018. However, we do have this variability that we see in the water use efficiency. And last year we had a very poor water use efficiency, but we also had 345 mils of rainfall. So sands aren't particularly good. Um, our water use efficiencies are quite low because it has low ability to store, store nutrients um, in the soil. So while we're improving, certainly improving yield, there's another opportunity to now to start to better improve our nutrient and uh, efficiency in those higher um, rainfall years, which we wish we had this year. Thanks, Bindi. So this property that we've uh, been showing you, quite, um, the research been doing on the paddock, we've got about 20, 25 years worth of uh, rainfall, uh, yield maps, whole farm yield. So there's a lot, a lot of information. So as you can see there, we've got the um, crop yield by growing season rainfall variation. So the big thing that stands out there is our rainfall and our yields are varying more year on year than they were back in the early 2000s. So you've got greater variability. So if there's greater variability, there's greater opportunity to increase returns and minimise losses on poor years. So if you look at that in a bit more detail, as, as Bindi said, we've doubled the water use efficiency over that 20 odd years. So, but look at the variability we're getting within that. Now, this year's number, I think will be quite high given we've, that farm's at 120 mils of rain. We'll probably harvest near on tonne of canola and tonne and a half of wheat, which is pretty exceptional. So we can't make the soil store any more water, but we can get more efficient at how much of that water we can utilise. Acidity management, deep ripping, topsoil sliding, all the other things we're doing and varying nutrition. So one of the big limitations is, is, acidity, is acidity in our farming systems. So what I've done there, we've looked at, the farm level lime application. So the orange bars there are the amount of lime this guy's been applying each year over his whole farm. In the early days, we weren't putting much on and we realized, hang on, lime is a big um, a big driver to our productivity. So we had to start investing in a lot of lime. So we've put on uh, some of those years up around 10, 12,000 tonne a year. Now, water use efficiency has increased and so is our liming rate. Now, the key, key thing with lime is what we've been able to do is look at the lime balance. Every tonne of grain we take off the off our farm causes a city. A byproduct of production is acidification of our soils. Most farms are still in catch-up mode. They're still trying to catch up and build up their soil prof soil acidity profile. But as our yield goes up, our acidification rate goes up. So what we've been able to do is look at the lime balance over that 20-odd years period of time. Now, while this farmer was trying to improve his um, soil pH profile, he had to invest a huge amount of money into, into lime in a short period of time then of course, then our yield goes up. So you've got to invest the money before the yield goes up. Then the yield goes up. As that yield goes up, your rate of acidification is increasing. So just to keep in front of that is a big investment. So a couple of good years and we're going backwards. So there's a huge opportunity going forward, which is what Vindy will speak about now. If our rate of acidification is varying across the paddock, there's another opportunity there to start to manage that variability. Now, I think I'll let Bindi explain what we're doing in this space now. Yep. 
All right, so we've gone from that farm scale and then let's bring it back down to the paddock scale to look at that variation. Like Topo said, what's the opportunity and how can we manage that? So we've improved that soil pH and we want to maintain that level now. So I actually took the yield map from uh, 20, this one's 2012, um, and I actually used it to calculate, um, estimate the amount of lime exported. So based on 0. 150 kilos per hectare, and the average um, across the whole paddock was 0.2, I think it's four tonnes per hectare of lime exported on a whole paddock basis. So then I, we compared it to what was it, what did the map look like in 2022? And we've done the same thing. We've got a much higher yield and the lime exported is up to 0.6 of a tonne per hectare. But when you actually have a look at the map, the underlying pattern of spatial variability is, is the same. So back in 2010, and in 2022, which comes back to that zoning to plant available water capacity and yield potential. So now the opportunity is, can we actually use this map as our variable rate, rate line map to help maintain our acidity rates? Because until now, like Topo said, we, there was had to be a big investment in lime, so it was blanket rate. But now the opportunity is to actually start targeting it and um, managing according to our um, yield potential. I guess nutrient um, efficiency is, is another opportunity. Um, this paddock is um, actually just to the north, the next farm over um, from the paddock we've been having a look at, but it's had similar history in that we've been, they've been applying lime deep rip down to 550 um, and increased yield um, to, a, to a similar level. But what we found in 2022 was the paddock actually didn't perform as well as we thought it should, given that really high rainfall. So actually had a go at um, using a similar approach with the nutrient balance. So looking at um, this one here is our total units of phosphorus applied. So it is variable rate. Um, there's three zones in this paddock, but the low zone um, is treated with a lower rate and the high zone and medium zone are treated the same for phosphorus. Um, and then I cal we cal use the yield map to calculate the estimated P uh, extracted. And I will say that we've also, due to economics and the budget, P has been dropped back on this farm for the last two years. So we kind of thought that that's might, you know, that might be one of the causes of um, the poor performance. And this map over here, I actually did it. We did it for I did it for four years. So looking at it was wheat canola, wheat canola. So just that longer term rotation rather than just based on that one year. And this is what a four year cumulative balance. Yep, and what you'll see here is we've actually got a negative P balance in these high yielding areas. So where the crop, we actually didn't apply, the crops extracted more um, phosphorus than we've applied. And we have the opportunity with the soils to store phosphorus, whereas when we have a look at nutrients like potassium and nitrogen, they're much more um, highly leachable and the story is not so straightforward. In fact, when I did the, um, the nutrient balance, we have suggest that we've over-applied potassium, um, but we don't have those um, levels in the soil. So our soil tests are low. Hmm. So just to pull it all together, um, over the last 10 years, we've effectively doubled our yield and improved our water use efficiency, although that is more variable. Plant available water capacity and soil zones um, haven't changed. They're the same. We've been managing the pH and compaction, but they're still ongoing challenges. So we're just, it's a bit like a Band-Aid, but we need to, um, they, they're still going to be a problem. So we have to keep managing them. And using that historical data now is the opportunity to try and target that management according to our um, soil zones and potential. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. So thanks, Bindi and Craig. I've just time for one quick question. Got one on the back, Tom. Um, my question is you doubled the yield, so that's a lot of extra biomass. If you, has the carbon level changed in the soil? Organic carbon, did you say? Yeah, can, organic carbon. Yeah. Can you ask me that question in two months? <laughs> No, that's actually, so the, those soil pits there, that's what we're actually going to measure. We, we're going to measure that car, that soil carbon and see what the levels are. On a like farm soil testing 
We haven't seen that. In fact, we've seen a decline in organic carbon. But when you open it up and, and you know, look at those pits, it looks like there's definitely, you know, been an increase in organic carbon. So I guess that's what we're going to try and manage uh, or, sorry, measure um, now because with the deep ripping, it's now looking at, well, the farm's at the level of do I come back and rip the same lines or do I come back and rip um, like off um, off those zones? So to be answered later. I'm going to follow up. Um, what step do you sample the carbon at on your normal testing? Because maybe it's deeper in the soil where there's carbon. We're testing down to 500. So every 10 centimetres down to 500. But the project that Bindi's working on is uh, doing quite an in-depth evaluation of the soil carbon through the profile as a result of our uh, model passes with the topsoil sliding plates. So are we burying that organic carbon deeper in the profile? We'll be able to answer that in a couple of months. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, we might move on now. So next, we're supposed to have Tom Longmire, but apparently Tom's flight was cancelled yesterday. So he's, I've heard that he's, I don't know if he's here yet. Give us a wave, Tom, if you're here. No, not here yet. But yeah, Tom's going to um, talk this afternoon at 10 past four, um, actually no, four, 4.40. So we've changed him to give him a bit of a break. So instead we're gonna have um, Siang Han from the University of Sydney, one of my PhD students actually. And I, I don't have a bio for Siang, but I could probably make something up. So Siang's going to submit her um, PhD in December. Is that right, Siang? Yes, it's on track. Yes, yeah, so, and actually we, a few of us from the University of Sydney went to the European Conference on Precision Agriculture um, in July this year, and Siang actually won the best talk of the whole conference, um, not out of students, but out of everyone. So that's a pretty big achievement. So expect big things, Siang, from you today. Um, but yeah, welcome, Siang. Hello there. Yeah, sorry for the, all the hype. Um, I'm not that impressive, Patrick. Thanks. Where is the thing? Here is the thing. Okay, so yeah. So today I will be presenting some work that we've been looking at. So we've been looking at uh, yield maps and also evapotranspiration. So why evapotranspiration? So put simply, um, evaporation is the amount of moisture that leaves the land. Transpiration is the amount of moisture that, that leaves from plants. And transpiration is the fraction that we're really interested in because it gives us an idea of how much plant available water there is which then you know, relates to photosynthesis and then crop yield, and everyone loves yield. So the struggle is we can't really measure transpiration on its own, it's pretty hard, but we can measure evapotranspiration as a whole. So there are two methods to kind of directly measure or infer it. The first one is flux towers. So you know, they're these big bulky devices, they go on a big parcel of land and they just continuously measure evapotranspiration over time. Now, the problem is we only have about 23 of them at the moment, you know, a couple more that are retired. So there's not too many because they're expensive, right? The other method that we use is to infer it with stream flow. So from the rain that falls and the, let me think, from the rain that falls and what ends up in the stream, what doesn't end up there is the water that's evaporated and the water that has been transpired. So that's how we calculate it. The problem is we can only really do it at a catchment level and we can only do it over a very long period of time. So, you know, that leaves a gap. You know, how do we find the final resolution spatial trends of evapotranspiration? And with these methods, we can't. So that's why we look at um, evapotranspiration products. So there are two products that cover Australia at the moment. So one that you might have heard of um, is Modus ET. It's been around for maybe a decade. And it is a global product, so it covers the entire world. The other one is Somerset ET. So this one's much newer, um, and it's a product by Syro. It covers all of Australia. So they use different equations to calculate ET, but uh, at the end of the day, they do use like almost exactly the same input. So they'll have some sort of a weather component, a crop component, and an image component. So MODIS will use uh, its own satellites for land cover and uh, the crop components whereas uh, Somerset uses the Landsat products. And the difference is then in their spatial and temporal resolution. 
So for MODIS ET, you can get an image uh, with 500 meters spatial resolution every eight days, whereas with Somerset, you get a resolution of 30 meters, but it only comes once a month. And at least for uh, all the things that I'll be talking about today, we look at the seasonal ET, so over the entire growing season. So that temporal resolution doesn't matter so much. What really matters is the spatial resolution. And uh, it's not really a secret. Um, Somerset is better. Yeah. So um, this is a really big field. Um, this is over 800 hectares. Uh, it was planted with canola. And for MODIS ET, it's a bit hard to see, especially from the back, but there's only 18 pixels there in total. 18. As for Somerset, um, there's thousands. So in the MODIS image, you can basically see no patterns at all. Uh, if you can see something, you know, you must have phenomenal eyesight. Um, as for Somerset, you can clearly see the areas that were not cropped. So that would be things like sheds, native vegetation, or pretty much just really bad parts in the field too, you know? So parts that were not cropped in that yield map over there. And that's pretty impressive. And then the other thing that you can spot is that the left side of the field is actually a little bit higher yielding than the right side. So Somerset is so far pretty good. And this is just a one yield map that we had of about 1,200. So we had yield data between 2017 and 2021 um, across all growing regions. And we focused on winter crops because they grow in dry land. So one less factor to worry about. And over half of those yield maps that we had, they were actually sown with wheat. And if we were to look at the yield differences between the different regions and across the seasons, is this a laser? Oh, that is a laser, okay. Um, yeah, so in this Western region, um, we can see for WA, generally the yield is a bit lower. So it'll be less than five tons a hectare whereas um, it will be higher in the other regions, but then they will be uh, subject to weather. So this was the 2018-19 drought in Northern New South Wales and Southern New South Wales, and you can see the dips in yield for, from those yields. And as for the yield maps, um, we love yield maps because they are high resolution, they are geolocated and they are time stamped. So that's the reason we knew where and how to calculate seasonal yield because we had the harvest dates and we knew exactly what was planted and where. Okay, so for our aims, we had uh, three simple aims. Uh, the first one we spent more time on because yeah, we worked on it more. The other two, you'll be getting a taster. So firstly, we wanted to know, can we use legacy yield data to validate essentially ET to make sure these ET products are good? There's a good relationship. Secondly, we wanted to know, can we use ET to then predict yield? And then lastly, we wanted to know, can we use ET to predict yield potential and then maybe identify where the yield gaps are? So essentially we wanna know, is ET useful for cropping? So part one, validating ET with yield data. So MODIS is pretty old. It's accepted that it's a pretty good, pretty accurate measure of ET. You know, it's good for what it's used for, which is usually hydrology. And we wanted to know, you know, is Somerset as good? You know, are the estimates as good? So to compare like for like, um, we aggregated Somerset to the 500 meter resolution for the same area. And you can see that, you know, there is a pretty strong relationship, strong linear relationship. Um, the correlation is 0 0.68, but it's not perfectly linear. It does look like a bit of an S, but they're comparable. We'll take it, we'll take it as a win. And when we compare the seasonal ET to yield, um, both of the products, you know, for each of the crop types, they have very similar correlations. They're comparable again. So if we look at the observed yield versus the evapotranspiration products, yeah, for MODIS, um, we can clearly see that, you know, there are different relationships for each of the regions. That's what the colors represent. And it's less clear in this one for Somerset, but these two, because this is a density plot, there's so many points. But these two yellow bits, they're very dense in data and they also represent the regions. So which ET product? Um, long story short, we choose Somerset. Um, MODIS, we do accept, you know, it's pretty good, but it's probably not the best choice for precision agriculture or cropping. Yeah. And the one caveat with Somerset is of course that it's a monthly product. You get one measurement a month or one averaged measurement a month. But you know, because we're looking at the seasonal ET, it doesn't really matter so much. Cool. And next two, 
Next part is predicting yield from ET. So I'm sure at these conferences, you've heard like a lot of uh, talks about predicting yield over the last few years. I have myself. And two uh, very common ones I've heard of these days. One is AppSim. I'm pretty sure nobody really, no grower uses AppSim, I think. But, you know, we researchers love to talk about it. The problem is it requires a lot of variables. And to measure those variables, it's a lot of work. The second one that we hear about a lot these days is data-driven models because there's so much freely available data. And then we put it all in a machine learning model and then we get nice yield predictions as well. But the problem is those are very complex methods. And also there's a bit of a skill gap if you wanted to replicate it. So today we are gonna look at a simple equation that's built on the direct relationship between transpiration and yield, which is right down here. So basically this section of the equation, ET times TF, so evapotranspiration times the transpiration fraction, that just gives us transpiration. And then we can multiply that by the water use efficiency, which is you know, in part driven by the harvest index and the transpiration efficiency. So these values, they're all in literature and they've been measured in the field. So if we use this simple equation, you know, we have ET products and we apply this equation, these are the predictions that we get. And uh, for the people who can't really see at the back, because it's, it's a pretty small screen, this is the observed yield on the x-axis. The y-axis is the yield predictions. And if it was a perfect fit, all these points would be on this red one-to-one -one line. But as you can see, the fit is not particularly good. And the main reason for that is because the transpiration fraction and the water's use efficiency, even though we've got the values from literature, they actually vary a lot. So they're gonna vary as the crop ages, they're gonna vary between the varieties, seasons and regions as well. So that was a bit of a bust, but that's okay because we have so much yield data, you know, we wondered, can we account for some of this variation? And so what we did was we fit a linear model, a very basic linear model, you know, for each region and crop. And we just picked up a slope and a constant so here's the equation that we had before. All we're doing now is we're multiplying it by the slope and the constant that we got. So essentially, we are calibrating these yield predictions with localized yield data because we have it, right? And this is what we end up with. So this top was what I showed before. You know, these points, they're not really on the one-to-one -one line. And then we multiply by a slope and a constant to get an optimized yield. And now all the points are on the line. So statistically, they're also better, but they're probably too small in numbers to see here. So here are the rest of the crops as well. Before the points, they're not really on the one-to-one -one line. Afterwards, they are much closer to that one-to-one -one line. Cool. And then the applications for this is that uh, essentially what we get is a free and simple yield estimate that we could apply anywhere in Australia. And this is particularly of interest to the industry and government because if you have a yield estimate, you know where the crop is grown with maybe like a crop type map, and you could get regional or national yield maps. So funnily enough, that's something we've been working on recently. So this is some work by Dahi, who's giving a talk tomorrow. And uh, he created a crop type map for winter crops in the Murray-Darling Basin. Yeah. So, you know, for the government and for industry, you know, we could improve harvest logistics. We get a better idea of food security. And, you know, maybe they could finally implement carbon accounting that makes sense. Finally, okay. But for growers, the real appeal here, the appeal here is historic yield maps. So Modus and Somerset, they're available from the year 2000, 2001. So if you didn't have a yield monitor back then, you know, you can still retrospectively go and create those yield maps. So our last section is about predicting potential yield. So firstly, a little bit of a definition because uh, I mix these up all the time and I see them mixed up in literature all the time as well. But the yield potential is the maximum possible yield. So we also call this to the genetic potential. So the point is it's unattainable. Like no one will ever achieve the yield potential. So this guy here, he has the world record for wheat yield. It's 18 tons per hectare. And if, make, if it makes you feel any better, he didn't achieve the yield potential either. But what he did get was the potential yield. So the potential yield is the maximum possible yield for the amount of water that you had and the best management possible. And there are equations to calculate the potential yield. 
Um, French and Schultz did one, Sadras and Angus had one too, and it's basically something like this. The potential yield is equal to water use efficiency multiplied by, you know, how much rainfall you got, and then you minus evapor uh, evaporation. And the problem is they define what water use efficiency is, they define evaporation. So really, your only variable is rainfall, which is very hard to uh, get a nice map off at fine resolution. So is this really a PA approach? We can do better, right? Yeah, we can do better. So introducing uh, the good old fashioned boundary line analysis. Yeah, this is not particularly new. Um, this paper was from 2004. So, I got to explain this good. So let me think about this for a second. Right. So what we need is a yield map and we need to plot this yield on the Y axis. And then we put a variable of interest on our X axis. So in this example, they used exchangeable potassium, which is essentially a measure of soil fertility. And then after we have that plot, we can fit a boundary line. So that is basically a smooth line over the maximum points of yield. So that line that they have there. So that is the maximum possible yield for, say, uh, a potassium level of whatever. And all the points underneath that boundary line are then limited by something else, if that makes sense. Because say we have a potassium, exchangeable potassium of eight, we know the maximum yield here is eight tons per hectare. So everything that less that we are getting is being limited by some other factor. So when we apply this to seasonal ET at the field level, this is a typical curve that we end up getting. So initially, you know, over here, so the more water we have, the higher evapotranspiration, transpiration, the more transpiration, the higher our yield is. And then at a certain peak or point, we reach a plateau where moisture becomes, it is no longer the most limiting factor. So, you know, there's probably something else that's limiting in the field. And then all these areas underneath, they're being limited by something else as well. In fact, there is a yield gap. So with this analysis, not only are we able to tell how big the yield gaps are, um, imagine each of these points is a 10 by 10 meter area in your field. We can tell where they are in the field. Unfortunately, we can't tell what they are caused by. <laughs> that is the limitation. But at least you know where to look. So for example, um, this point here in the field, this 10, point, 10 by 10 meter area, we know that there's a two ton per hectare yield gap. So, you know, we could go out there, we could have a look. We know that the moisture is there. So what's limiting, you know, maybe you'll go there, you'll find a big patch of weeds. Maybe you'll go there and you'll find out that, uh, I don't know, a bunch of insects. Maybe your soil is awful over there. Something has terrible has happened. But regardless, you know where to look. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other application that we have here is we can define management zones instead by yield gaps. So instead of, you know, defining management zones by how much yield we're actually getting, we can define it by how much yield we think we actually can get. And then the problem is what happens if, you know, your farm or your field, it's never reached the potential yield. Then we can look at this boundary line analysis at a district level. So we just uh, we develop achievable yield targets at a district level. So that's that red line there. So for example, we've got two farms here. We say farm A, farm B. They're in the same Geraldton dish. I'm butchering it. Um, Geraldton. Geraldton. <laughs> Sorry. Geraldton district. And we know that farm A, you know, farm B, they have similar soils because they're in the same district. And we know they're getting the same amount of ET. But we know that there is a yield gap and it makes you wonder, you know, what is farm A doing right? What is farm B missing out on? You know, is this different something we can manage? And yeah, that is the strength of the boundary line analysis. <laughs> to conclude, um, don't sleep on ET. 77% of growers, you know, use yield monitors, you know, so if any of the 23% is not here, you know, it's time to get started. Um, and the important thing is, and I've shown just three examples today. So we looked at, you know, simple yield predictions. We looked at estimating the yield potential. We looked at locating yield gaps, right? And this is all data that, you know, pretty much if you've got a yield monitor and you have access to the internet, you could do yourself. 
So in the future, um, what we could do, you know, we could improve what we currently have. It is still a work in progress, but we could also then calibrate ET. Anyhow, thanks for listening. Thanks, Yang. Um, we've got time for one quick question. Sorry, just introduce yourself. I'll just get this. Uh, Roger Laws, CSIRO. Uh, really nice presentation. Thank you. Um, just wondering if you compared the yield potential estimates that you generated through your method with the methods generated, say, from Apsom, where you did have some good with the ability to calculate it. That is a great question, but unfortunately for Apsim, I don't have the variables that I need to calculate it. That That is the caveat, unfortunately. Yeah, that's about all I can say, sorry. Thank you. All right, thanks, Yang. We'll move on. Yeah, so next up we've got Jake Mahew from um, John Deere is gonna give us an industry update. Um, and Jake is the digital technology lead there at John Deere. Thanks, Jake. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Jake McHugh. I'm digital technology lead for John Deere. Um, so I basically work with our precision ag software across Australia and New Zealand. Um, good to be here at SPA this year. Uh, obviously, um, precision ag is at the core of what we do. Um, as our chairman and CEO has said, we're no longer a industrial um, manufacturer. We're now a technology company. So no longer just looking to build hard iron. Um, we're now trying to provide the total solution um, to our customers, which is including um, hardware systems as well as software systems. So Precision Ag is at, is at the core of what we do, um, and that's why we're here today. So um, on that note, given it's September and we're fast approaching harvest uh, here in Western Australia and obviously in other districts throughout Australia, um, today... I'm going to give you a quick rundown of some of our current uh, technology, precision ag technology, and some of our upcoming precision ag technology um, that will apply to harvest this year. So, operation center. Has anyone here? <laughs> operation center before. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so operation center as our cloud that our machines um, are collecting is this and the likes of that. Um, fully integrated with our machines. Um, all of our majority of our machines are connected these days. Um, basically, only has about 500,000 connected machines throughout the week six. Um, so connectivity um, is a massive uh, part of our strategy moving forward and operation center as um, the platform that allows us to exploit that connectivity. So there's lots of um, great features that we use in operation center. Um, particularly when it comes to harvest, um, work planning. So we can reduce setup in field by planning all of our work beforehand, sending it to the machine, and then the machine just recognizes what field it's in and will update work settings accordingly. Um, also lots of uh, machine monitoring and logistics capability, seeing where the machine is, what it's doing, how much fuel it's got, um, how productive it is at the second, and the likes of that. There's a new feature that was released at the start of this year, which will be incredibly helpful for Harvest, uh, data sync. We've had data sync for work data for many years, um, but now we have data sync for setup data. Basically what this is doing is it's syncing 
all of the displays in our machines, which applies to our current Gen 4 machine uh, displays and G5 displays moving into next year. Um, syncing those displays with our operation centre for setup data, including your client farm fields, your guidance tracks, field boundaries, um, products, operators, and likes of that. Um, and then operation centre is going to send it to every other synced machine as well. So effectively, you're in one harvester, you drop a new AB line within seconds, it's on the display and the next harvester ready to go. So you don't need to worry about using USBs, you don't need to worry about any manual data transfer. Um, anything you enter in that display is automatically going to show up on the next display within seconds. Um, very helpful feature, had a lot of good feedback on that. Um, very, very good tool to reduce um, manual data handling and ma make life a lot easier for our operators and our farmers. Also released this year was our new SF7000 Starfire receiver. Um, improvement on our Starfire 6000 receiver. So we've now gone from two to four satellite constellations. Obviously has a lot more access to a lot more satellites. Um, which is reducing uh, shading, basically. So our, our pull-in time is a lot better in paddock. Um, any shading event where you move under a tree, anything like that, um, it's going to pick up full accuracy again a lot quicker than our old 6000s will. Um, also, boot time is a lot faster. Uh, also has access to new and simplified signal offerings, including our new SFRTK, which provides 2.5 centimetre SF or oh, sorry RTK like accuracy for up to five years without any base station required. That's all done, all correction from satellite. Um, so handy new bit of hardware that has just been released this year. We'll see it on headers for the first time um, this season. Harvest Lab three thousand grain sensing. So um, basically. Our harvest lab has been around for a number of years on our forage harvesters um, for constituent sensing um, in maize. However, this year we've now released the capability for constituent sensing in grain. So this is what it looks like. It's the exact same piece of hardware that we've seen on our forage harvesters for a number of years. Um, it's a near infrared uh, spectroscopy sensor. What it's doing here, it's mounted on the clean grain elevator of one of our S700 harvesters. It's pulling the, the grain from the one side of the elevator, pulling it across the lens of the sensor there, and then pushing it across the other side of the elevator um, while the machine's moving, providing live data um, on the constituents of that grain. So uh, available for the first time this year on our S700 harvesters, uh, 2018 or newer, and uh, will be um, available on our X9 harvesters in the near future as well. So what capability is that giving us? It's basically allowing us to map our constituents. This is a yield versus protein map in wheat. So there's three cops that it's available on for grain constituent sensing at the moment. Wheat is doing protein and moisture. Barley is doing starch, protein, moisture. And then canola is doing oil, protein and moisture. Um, so everyone very excited about this new feature. Um, green on green uh, protein sensing capability. All that data automatically collected in the display and streamed straight back into Op Center um, for use at a later date. Uh, Op Center has some good basic analysis functions, but that data is easily accessible through API um, or Shapefile or however you, you choose to use it to other platforms if you wish to use other platforms to, to analyze that yield and protein data further. Combine Advisor, on-machine technology. Um, Combine Advisor, been around for a couple of years now. Um, what is it? It's basically a series of cameras mounted on our clean grain elevators, as well as the tailings elevator, um, and using artificial intelligence software to analyze that grain sample and then um, make adjustments in the Combine settings to maintain that grain quality. So um, it's assessing for... Um, trash, broken grain, and the likes of that. And then it will alter rotor speed, um, concave clearance, your sieves, your fan, and the likes of that on the go. Um, it's not going to set the quality for you. You 
decide where you want to set that quality point at. Once you've got that point, you tell it, this is where I want to keep it. And then it will endeavor to maintain it um, at that point. So it's basically it's reducing operator input, reducing operator fatigue, and vastly improving grain quality, and particularly, obviously, the consistency of grain quality by maintaining those settings on the go. We've also got our machine sync system. Again, been around for a few years now. Um, what is it? It's basically um, virtually docking, I like to say, the chaser bin with the header. So... Um, Providing that you have the right software capabilities, you've got two Gen 4 screens, um, obviously one in the harvester, one in the chaser bin tractor. Um, that tractor will pull up next to the harvester, um, push auto track, it'll virtually dock next to the harvester. The um, chaser bin driver doesn't need to steer the machine, doesn't need to um, control the speed of the machine. Um, that tractor is just going to stay exactly at a set point in relation to that harvester, um, reducing uh, operator fatigue during long harvest hours, um, reducing operator error, particularly when you've got green operators, um, pun intended. But, um, so yeah, very handy little feature. Um, yeah, I've, I've used it a number of times myself and it's um, once set up correctly, it's just very, very easy to use and does a very good job. It also gives the the harvest operator the capability to um, change the uh, position of the chaser bin in relation to the harvester straight from the harvester screen. So you can be moving that chaser bin forward and back on his screen or closer towards him, further away, um, because obviously the, the harvester operator has a much clearer picture of, of what's happening in that bin um, than the actual chaser bin driver himself does. This is what it looks like. You got your leader, your follower screen. Um, they both have similar capabilities. The harvester driver can be moving that machine left, right, forward, and back, as well as the uh, um, the chase bin driver himself. But no manual steering at all needed. Um, and then as soon as there's manual override, and the chase bin driver just drives that straight back to the um, straight back to the truck or mother bin. So there's some of our current technologies that we have available. What's shaping the precision? Uh, what's shaping the future of precision agriculture? Um, there's a lot of work that our intelligent solutions group, ISG, our tech headquarters, are doing, and a lot of these spaces encompassing all of this technology. So, like I mentioned, connectivity is a massive piece of what we're what we're doing, and is going to be integral to what we do moving forward in terms of utilizing our machines to their the best capability. Uh, machine sensors, obviously the machines, are the, uh, they're the ones in the paddock doing the job. Um, there's a lot of capability for them to record data and, and we can utilize that data moving forward to make better decisions, um, become more efficient, become more sustainable, become more profitable farmers. Artificial intelligence, so, and robotics, basically giving those machines the capability to use that data from those sensors to make their own decisions in real time, reducing the need for to go back to a, to a farmer, assessing it after the fact when the work's already been done, giving the machine that capability to make decisions on the go while it's doing the job and refine that job, do a much better high quality job. And um, yeah, it's basically moving us towards autonomy. So what are some of the new features that we're going to be looking at in the future? Um, we have a new feature coming out very, very soon on our operation center, um, AutoPath. We currently have AutoPath, which is used extensively in row cropping. Um, basically, you're recording everywhere you've been during a um, seeding operation, for instance. It's recording that as a map, um, saving it as guidelines, and then sending it to a harvester, and then you drive the harvester. It's going to drive exactly where that um, seed has been because it knows everywhere it's been. So instead of using guidance lines, you know, just following the exact path of where your seed has been. Um, we now have that capability in the next few weeks to be able to do that from boundary, providing you've mapped your boundary accurately instead of just using an AB line. We can draw out the paths for that entire paddock before we even start the operation, send it to a machine. It knows exactly everywhere it's going in that paddock. We also have a new feature um, on harvesters. So auto turn, um, auto track turn automation, uh, we've had auto track turn automation on our tractors for a number of years now. 
um, that is now moving into our harvesters. So um, watch the space. We're aiming to have this available for harvest this year. So um, next couple of weeks, um, there might be an, an announcement on that. Watch the space. That sums up my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be here for the next couple of days. My colleagues, Patrick, Lance, um, Josh from AFGRI, we're here. We'll be knocking around. Um, so feel free to come up and have a chat to us about any of these technologies you've seen today, any other technologies that you want to know about, whether it's seeding, application, spreading, whatever it is, just, um, yeah, feel free to come and say hi and we'll, we'll give you the rundown. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Um, next up, we've got Doug Hamilton from CSBP. He's made the big trip from Fremantle today. So welcome, Doug. Um, but yeah, so Doug's an agricultural GIS specialist at CSBP who has been involved in the progressive development of CSBP's PA products. So today he's going to talk about some of the research and science that they've been doing at CSBP and in particular, the use of real-time nitrogen sensing for crop nitrogen management. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about uh, real-time nitrogen sensing, but um, probably one thing I'll open with is that I've got a lot of respect for, for the growers that are out there using Precision Ag, being able to implement that really well in their field um, among all the other decisions that you've got to make out there. So it's, it's really challenging to adopt new technology. Um, and as part of this, I'm going to offer a perspective on CSBP and developing uh, developing precision because it's also just about as difficult in doing that from um, the industry point of view in developing new technology. So I'm just going to start by setting the scene somewhat. So in terms of yield gap, um, on average, you've got yields of around uh, 1.7 tonne per hectare in terms of um, where that yield gap might be. So we saw a yield gap presented earlier, um, and this is from 2018 with um, Hockman and Haran, who uh, calculated that figure of 1.7 tonne, and that's often attributed to low nitrogen um, fertiliser input, so not enough nitrogen to replace the nitrogen that was being removed in the crop. Another good example, 2021 in Australia, close to um, almost half of that crop or from 2021 ended up with about 8.6% protein. So you can see there's actually quite a quite a low level of nitrogen um, in those crops that have been removed in these high yields, in those high yielding years. And another example is 2022, where if you look at the ASW um, and ASW9 deliveries, it makes up over 60% of the, the crop that was delivered. So you can see a lot of low protein wheat. So suboptimal, there is a reason for this, and it really comes back to risk management. Um, growers are uh, not wanting to apply nitrogen if they're not going to get a response to that. So it's a, it's a rational decision to be making is to reduce your nitrogen inputs in order to be able to reduce your risk. So it's a, it's a very rational decision that's being made at this, at this point um, where the other aspect about this, and which is something that we're trying to explore with the real-time nitrogen sensing is that can timely and actionable information actually help reduce the perceived risk uh, associated with applying nitrogen in particular years? And can you increase confidence in applying or, or not applying nitrogen fertilizer as well? When this works, it's good. Technology is always good when it works and then it doesn't work. So in terms of the growers challenge that we're talking about, um, applying more nitrogen, having good information to be able to apply or, or to reduce the, the risk of applying nitrogen or increase the confidence in applying nitrogen. So the challenge from a grower's point of view is you've got a very small window about when you can make that nitrogen decision. We, we don't always have a, well, we don't have a crystal ball. It'd be nice to have that, to be able to use that to inform nitrogen decisions, but the best option that we can look at in terms of what you can actually achieve in terms of managing nitrogen is your is your lab uh, analysis or analysis of nitrogen in the crop. Have you taken up enough nitrogen at this point to be able to achieve the yield potential that you're talking about uh, being able to achieve? So lab turnaround, 
um, by the time you've gone out, collected those plant samples, sent the samples back to the laboratory, and then had those samples tested at the lab, quite often the information that you've got is there after you've made that decision and it then tells you whether it was the right decision or not. So in terms of what we wanted to try and do with CSBP Detect is what we wanted to do is to be able to provide as real-time analysis as we could to be able to provide a quicker turnaround um, of, of, a, of a nutrient analysis for a plant. So the kind of technology that we started on, this is going back to say about 2015 when we started doing a, a desktop study to look at what are, the, what are the technologies that are out there that we can actually use to be able to um, find a way to produce a real-time nutrient analysis. So we looked at a range of sensors, so your, your satellite imagery from uh, drone imagery, uh, handheld sensors like NDVI and chlorophyll meters, um, also other technology like X-ray fluorescence meters. And what we were looking at and what we were keeping in, in mind was that we wanted a technology that has potential to look at not just nitrogen, but potentially other nutrients. Um, we wanted a technology that's handheld. And if it was going to be handheld, it needed to have Bluetooth to be able to communicate by a smart, smartphone application off to the cloud to get the analysis back. Um, we didn't want to have large data sets. So if you're talking hyperspectral cameras on a drone, for example, you've got a very large data set that ne then needs to be processed. Um, things like uh, Elon Musk Starlinks definitely brought connectivity a lot closer along than where it was back in 2015. Then we were looking at that, but you're still talking about large data sets. And back then we were thinking this is going to be an ongoing issue for a while. And so in the end, where we ended up was landing was on near-infrared spectroscopy. And what we were able to do with the device that we were using is um, the nitrogen percent, and we can also generate a nitrogen status. So it's not just the nitrogen percent, we're trying to make it a bit more actionable. What What's the status that we can actually, uh, integrating a status as well out of that. That was the initial uh, iteration of what we came out with. And the subsequent journey of, of us going through testing this in the market and seeing what are the things that we need to be adding in in terms of information. Um, and part of that was also, um, looking at yield potential, what's the yield potential that we're looking at and how the calculations relate to your recommendations, um, looking at the soil test results as well to infer when the soil would potentially run out of nitrogen to, to look at how the plant's performing compared to where the soil tests were saying the plant should be performing by the end of the season when your top-up nitrogen applications are being made um, and also the economics. Um, if you're going to be, if there is enough of a yield gap to um economically return an investment on nitrogen. And we wanted to be able to do this as close to real time as we can. So in terms of the predictions, so this is the 2020 season, 2022 season, we've trained the calibration models on um, the previous five years of data that we've collected. Um, and this is for wheat and barley. So we've got a nitrogen calibration for wheat and barley that we were using in the, in the last couple of years for piloting and then recently um, uh, as a commercial product. So we've trained this across a number of years. Um, we've trained it across a number of varieties of, of wheat and barley. And we've also trained the, 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 the training data sets are also capture a wide range of geographic and environmental and, um, and weather conditions. So we're, we're seeing like a, a very, uh, also a number of trial sites. So you've got varying levels of nitrogen at each one of those combinations of, of, um, of factors that I was talking about. So it's it's not as accurate as the lab. We're not trying to be as accurate as the lab, but we're trying to be able to provide a quick and easy analysis on how how your crop's performing in terms of nitrogen uptake. So uh, R squares 0.87, RMSE about 0.5. So the mean average percent error is around 11, 11.7%. So it's it's a reasonable calibration for what we're trying to do with this technology. Don't seem to remember where to point this. That one? Oh, that one? Okay. Thanks, Brent. So this is the, the basic output that we were looking at producing first. Um, I can't really point it out on the screen, but if you look, you've got nitrogen percent there, and then it infers that into a status. So it's not just about the nitrogen percent in the crop, but it's also inferring a status. And that status is informed by your yield potential and also the weight of the plants in the in the sample as well. So that's the dry weight, which you can see in the figures there. So feedback from the field was, okay, that's nice, but it's not quite actionable enough. So then we thought we, we brought about 
bringing in some additional layers of information. Um, and so this was this is what we were using in the initial pilot products of the year about it, it, pilot uses of this about three years ago. So then we started to bring in a lot more um, a lot more complications. So you can see on the the left hand side of the screen you've got the job planning. So being able to send a device and and plan where you want to go out into the field. Um, you've got the the plant and the spectrometer and the Bluetooth smartphone application. We're using Decipher Ag, which is CSVP's GIS interface, to be able to plan out where to do this sampling. Because a big part of what we found with just going out randomly into the field. Um, you don't always get a reasonable or a representative view of the of the the performance across the paddock. So really, you need to start planning out where you should be going in the field. So we're using imagery layers through Decipher Ag to do a lot of this planning. Um, we're combining the chemometric model, so that's interprets the near infrared spectra into the nitrogen percent. We've got the status model, which is again on the the left hand side of the box of the cloud models, and that's inferring the nitrogen percent for the age and the weight of the plant. Is it sufficient or is it marginal? Um, we're also brought across things like the yield potential. So what's the realistic yield potential for this season? Um, the soil status, how much soil nitrogen do we expect to be available to the plant based on rotation and based on soil testing layers? Um, and then recommendations and economics on there as well. So we're starting to build in more complexity based on feedback from the market that we're getting. This is some, uh, it's a bit of a busy slide, sorry, but this sort of shows through some of the features and how we're displaying that. So you've got um, different combinations of yield potential in the middle box on the left. So you've decile five or decile eight. So you're starting to look at different combinations of if you want to achieve a higher yield, this is the additional nitrogen you'd want to apply. Um, then you've got the, the real-time nitrogen sensing, which is um, in the bottom in the middle and the nitrogen status of the soil. So we're looking forward at this point from um, the soil test result to see based on this yield and based on um, how much uh, uh, how much nitrogen was in the soil or from your rotations, how much, when you would expect that nitrogen to start running out. Um, and then we've got the yield potential based on decile reading. So we're pulling silo data for this. So um, five kilometre weather grids from silo and looking at what the different rainfall levels would be based on the decile finishes. Uh, and then some economics. So are you likely to get a return on investment? So I'll trying to bring in more information that sits around that decision around whether you want to actually, whether a grower does want to apply nitrogen or, or not. So I talked about how we're iterating through as more feedback comes through on the market. And I touched on before about um, being smarter about where we do the sampling. And so the, the last product that has, this is kind of led towards is the idea of a, of a nutrition service, which is what we'd call CSBP detect. Uh, plus, and in this case, we're starting to be a lot more smarter about planning out where we want to go. And this take this is where we start taking into account what rotations the the grower has. Um, so capturing different rotations and um, different soil types, and that's through that management zoning um, through Decipher Ag. Looking at what um, looking at what that sampling package needs to look like. Um, looking at the early season nutrition, particularly through plant sampling, because we know that CSBP detect can only pick up the nitrogen in the cereals. So that means we need to be a bit smarter about particularly things like potassium because uh, the, the nitrogen status in the plant is going to be influenced by other limitations, particularly potassium, which we know is quite, quite prevalent across a lot of WA soil. So testing early in the season to make sure there's, or to eliminate if there is other issues and we can address those early in the season by understanding that using plant sampling, then using detect for the end of the season to look at what final rates of nitrogen are we looking at applying to achieve a particular yield potential. So we're, we're trying to eliminate other factors to just focus on nitrogen as part of the sampling service. Um, and the, the final piece around the idea of the sampling package is to then review the results because quite often CSBP is quite good at um, planning and and doing the soil sampling and making a recommendation, but they don't often bring that information back and review how how well did our recommendations perform, where have we seen opportunities missed in, in the cropping side of things, um, and looking at the, the nutrient levels in the different zones um, from the grain as well. So you're looking at what's your removal of NPK and not assuming the, the standard removal rates because those can, can vary quite a bit depending on soil type and season. So that's that's kind of where we've we've moved across. As more feedbacks come through, we've tried to integrate this to try and 
try and bring about a product that's more tailored towards what growers are, are, are requesting and to seeing if we can provide a level of information that can give greater confidence around that nitrogen decision at the end of the season. So in terms of results from the 2022 season, um, we had about 15 growers enrolled in Detect Plus. So that's the, that's the, the sampling service. Um, we had people going out and taking these samples. So we're doing the planning. We're having um, people that we've trained to use the, the technology and taking that technology out into the field and um, using that, uh, doing the sampling. So 2022 current record in WA for production with a lot of really low grain quality. What we found out of the growers involved in the pilot that were willing to share um, financial information was that four out of the five growers reported higher quality grain, so APW and AH deliveries um, compared to their neighbours. And we're able to use um, some crop yield estimates from digital um, agriculture services. And from there, we're able to work out based on doing a, a radius around the growers' crops that the, the Detect Plus customers averaged about 200 kilos greater in terms of grain production. Um, and that's wheat and barley yields, so your cereal yields compared to the surrounding 30 kilometres. So we're seeing not necessarily um, due to more nitrogen either. Sometimes this is also because growers have seen certain different, well, splits between splits in yield potential between different blocks. So moving nitrogen from one block across to the other, um, even moving nitrogen between paddocks as well to be able to target uh, target different yield potentials or different um, different nitrogen uptake levels in the paddocks as well. So when you when you think about not just increasing yield, there's also an increase in that protein that's coming out so better quality grain and particularly in 2022 where you're seizing where you're seeing differences in your grade uh, pricing from 40 to, to 80 dollars a ton, extra grain production, plus the additional protein has really helped um, pay for that back in this season. So I, I just want to run through a few conclusions on this. Um, so providing a, a high level of information can give growers greater confidence in applying more nitrogen. We've seen that in the nitrogen uptake or at least changing around where they're doing their nitrogen applications. But um, it also really depends on um, the grower's attitude to risk, so getting a sense of this, and that's going to be influenced by their, their assessment of the season, and it's going to be influenced by their financial position as well. Um, and the other, the other part to this is that um, you, you've also got to have a lot of trust. Uh, so that's growers trusting CSBP in using their tool or trusting the tools that CSBP is developing, um, and the person providing that interpretation of this information needs to have that level of trust with the, with the growers as well. Um, so in terms of the, the, the tool that CSBP detect is it, it uses the spectroscopy on the leaf. So the, the, the kind of recognizing that in developing these kind of tools that the, there is often limitations in how well you can provide um, information or how quickly you can provide information. You've always got to make a lot of compromises in, in what you're trying to get to market at a point in time. So when you're starting to think about um, developing a new tool, um, you need to get it out into the market to get it tested, to try and get it working. And it, you've always got to make some compromises in what you can actually develop um, and what you're actually going to deliver because you need to get that feedback from the field and that, that feedback needs to be in real time. So, and, and, is, uh, you, and that feedback needs to make sure that you have a level of trust with that grower in, in getting that feedback as well, because it's really important for us in developing these tools to, to have that trust with the growers so that we can continue to develop these tools. And CSBP is really fortunate to work with some really good growers in doing this. Um, and we're also really fortunate that the, the leadership team at the Fertiliser Business does have or does value investing in new technology and, uh, and are happy to, to go about um, investing in technology like Detect um, in order to be able to try and bring about it, uh, bring about some change in the industry to be able to um, invest in the industry and keep moving the industry forward in terms of new technology. Because new, new technology is changing all the time and it is a, it is a big risk in investing in technology. And, and it's um, one of those things where the, the more trust that's in the industry um, and the more investment we can bring into it, ideally that's going to mean that we can attract more um, bright minds into the future um, for the ag industry because those bright minds are what's going to move that industry forward as well as that investment. So that's the uh, end of my talk. Thank you.
Thanks for that, Doug. Um, we've got time for a quick one or two questions. Yep, just yep. Just a microphone here, and just introduce yourself too, if you could. I, I can hear you okay, Josh. That's all right. Hi, Josh Mackey. I'm uh, We've we've looked at other nutrients and what we're finding is that if the nitrogen concentration is higher, it tends to also be um, when we were developing the machine learning models to be able to predict other nutrients, we were finding it was getting a lot more clouded by the nitrogen percent. So if the nitrogen percent was low, it would tend to predict low K and low P. So the ability to be able to discriminate between low nitrogen as opposed to low nitrogen driven by low K is not as easily um, achieved as we thought initially we'd be able to do that with. So we've looked at P and K, but we haven't been able to develop a particularly good calibration at this point. It's just for the nitrogen. If I could just steal a question, Doug. Um, so obviously this is a handheld hyperspectral sensor you're using with NIR. Uh, there's a, a lot oh, of work. Hyperspectral, so it's um, it's a point. So you put the leaf into the, so it's not a camera, like a pixel. Yeah, but but the sensor itself um, detects many different. Yeah, yeah. so it's a hyperspectral um, yeah, sensor, not an imager. But so there's a lot of work being done on hyperspectral um, satellites. So yep. where do you see the future in terms of CSBP? Is there a vision about perhaps using, you know, hyperspectral sensors on satellites to detect nitrogen status and nutritional status of crops? Yeah, we're um, talking with a couple of uh, hyperspectral satellite providers, some of the some of the local ones. Um, hyperspectral, the, the, part of the reason why we chose the handheld sensor is that it's a lot easier to develop these calibration models because you can use trial plots Whereas the hyperspectral satellites, then you start needing to be able to, um, and I, I suppose technology has come along to a point now where you can use in-field trials. So planning that out um, using other software. Um, so in-field trials so that you've got a wide enough strip to be able to um, see that from a satellite point of view. Because some of these hyperspectral satellites are sort of 30 meter pixels. So you can't use the small plot trials, which is what we've used to develop the handheld sensor. Um, the hyperspectral stuff is quite interesting, and as as that evolves, we will definitely be looking at that more. But it's how do we do, go about developing good calibrations if you're going to have to go and take a lot of sampling in the field and do that same replicated high, low, medium nitrogen rates across different seasons, across varieties, across um, crop types. It starts to bring a lot of testing required, but it's it's a, of interest. Cool. All right, we'll just thank Doug. Thank you. Oh yeah, and and, and and CSBP do have a booth here. That's right, Doug. So if you want to if you want to talk to anyone from CSBP, they'll be here today and tomorrow as well. So um, now we're going to have Adam Sparks, who's from the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, or DPERD. So Adam leads the Systems Modeling and Climate and Weather Branch in DPERD's Farming Systems Innovation Directorate. So the team conducts research and development activities to build improved decision support tools and agricultural systems models. And today he's going to talk about a very interesting title, Better Living Through Better Liming, Strategies for the Whole Farm. Thanks for that, Adam. Thanks for that introduction. So today I'm going to talk about a project funded by the Food Agility CRC, FA099. It's entitled WA Farm Data Sharing, um, but we're actually, we are focused on data sharing, but we're using whole farm liming as our um, project basis. I want to emphasize this is a project that Deeper leads, and I'm the project lead, but it's in conjunction with the Grower Group Alliance, um, Access Tech as our industry partner, and Curtin um, University are also involved. The easiest way to think about this is like iLime, but for the whole farm. And if, you, if you're from WA, you've probably seen iLime. It's an app based on the OptLime model. Um, Chris Gazy and his group developed this in conjunction with JRDC. We've taken this app and turned it into an API that we can programmatically call over and over and over. So instead of having someone sit at an iPad and enter every paddock on the farm and do this for every scenario or every strategy you want to try, 
we have the ability to run this um, for all seven default strategies, any custom strategies that you want um, millions of times in a couple of hours. Oh, sorry. Currently we offer the seven iLime strategies just by default plus no remediation. Um, so shown here, all these are based on a 20 year run. Um, I'm not gonna read them off to you, but this is what iLime offers and we've replicated this exactly. So every report that comes out doing nothing with your soil pH. And you may ask yourself, why liming? It's not the most exciting topic. Um, we wanted to make it a little bit less onerous and a little bit less difficult. And we didn't envision that it was quite this difficult, but liming is one of those things that we've already heard. It, it takes a big upfront investment and you have to figure out, is this really gonna pay me back? And what's the best way to do this? And we had the iLime app sitting right there. Thankfully, Chris Gazy and Deep Purd's been a supportive uh, individual helping us with this along the way. He's not part of the project, but he's very aware and very engaged with the development of it. And we wanted to see, could we do something that would help you make a decision for your farm? You could compare a bunch of different strategies and see what might happen based on your own farm's data. Now, the, the way that this differs from most other whole farm models is this actually uses the data from your farm to run the model instead of saying, well, a farm in the Esperance region or the farm around Meriden or, or Geraldton tends to act like this based on these generic soils we use actual soil data from your farm, the yield data, et cetera, and run the model. So how does it work? Well, basically we ingest as much existing data as, as we can, as you will share with us. We understand there are limitations to what some people want to let off the farm. At a bare minimum, we need paddock yield, uh, crop and cropping sequence, rotation, and soil sampling data. Access Tech is currently working with us, they help you get it out of your head, off the, the receipt you scribbled on that's on the, the ute floor in the cab, um, out of John Deere's cloud hosted service and gets it into something that we can actually ingest through an API. We heard earlier when we were welcomed about Extrata, Deep Herd's secure data sharing platform. So we use Extrata to transfer everything from Access Tech over to Deep Herd. Using Extrata means that you can say, at any time, no, we don't want you to have access to that data and flip the switch and it's turned off. We don't have access to it any longer. It's fully secured, um, uses best security protocols, et cetera. We bring it over to Deep Herd. There's only three people that actually have access to the data at Deep Herd. I'm one of them, another modeler and my developer. And then we use that data in the iLine model to predict yield, crop value and other soil characteristics. It then goes back through Extrata. Farmer can then say, yes, I want to have this in my Access Tech Access Stream. And you can view the results in a report that hopefully is easy to read and understand. So the most simple way to think about what the model does, if you've read anything about it or have ever heard of Monte Carlo simulations, we run millions of different possible scenarios. We take uh, crop yields, and farm gate prices and mix them together to simulate good years, bad years, normal years, whatever, for 20 years for the different scenarios that iLime offers. And this is just some made up data, but this shows when you start plotting stuff over time, you end up with a bunch of lines that kind of overlap. And this is basically what we're doing. The data that we use in the model, we need paddocks that have the following characteristics. We need at least one year of cropping data. If you only give us one year, we assume that you grew that crop in rotation for 20 years. Um, we need the crop yield on a paddock basis or a management basis and soil pH of less than seven. Uh, this is just because the way iLime works. Currently, we can't do any strategic maintenance. We can only do remediation. Um, we have to have soil pH at zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20, 30 centimeters because we build custom soils as you can in iLime. And without this information, then it's not really customized to your setting. And we need the soil texture data as well because we don't, we want to make this as custom to your operation as possible. We don't, don't want to make assumptions 
if we don't have to. Some other data we use in the model, we do predict the rainfall zone. If you give us the, ge the data and it has geographic location in it, then we use that automatically to predict if it's a high or moderately high or moderately low or low rainfall zone. Um, we also use the location to pick the nearest line pit. We assume that's the one that's going to be used. And we use the line values that DPIRT has for each of those line pits. We take, unless we, you provide us with farm gate prices, we take grain and graze, port prices. And CBH has been kind enough to give me a, a geographic file that has their drop-off locations geocoded. So we use that to determine the nearest drop-off location. And then we calculate back calculate freight cost and come up with a reasonable estimate over the past 20 years of what the farm gate prices were and use that for our inputs into the model about the price that you would have gotten for a crop. We use these to then just come up with a bunch of different combinations of yield based on your data that you gave us about yield. Plus we use these prices and run the model a few million times. We do, if we have to make some assumptions. So we're soil data. We're missing. Um, we have assumed that this exchangeable aluminium class is moderate. Um, soil organic carbon contents 1% and soil gravels 5. That's because these things aren't necessarily easy to get in some soil tests. And thankfully, we have Chris Gazy around to say, make these assumptions when you, you, you're you missing this stuff. So oh, getting to the good stuff. Um, these are completely made up numbers. This is not actual farm data, just to be clear. Uh, my programmer just made up some things for me to be able to show all of you what the strategies look like. So this is an example. One of the first figures you see is cash flow. I've got two different strategies here, one and six that I randomly picked. So strategy one on the left is one ton of lime per 10 years. And strategy, strategy six is four tons of lime incorporated to 20 centimeters. On the x-axis is year one through 20, and on the y-axis is the cash flow. And when you look at this, you see three lines. The upper line is light orange. It is decile nine, or 90% of values fall below that line. There's another light orange line across the very bottom. That's decile one. 10% of values fall below that. 80% of values fall between those two lines. And the dark red line is the one I want you to pay attention to because those are the most likely values. Those are the ones we saw the most times when we ran the model over and over and over. So every year, that value was the most commonly observed value that we got back. So that's what we think is the most likely occurrence if you're going to follow this strategy. We also report cash, cumulative cash flow, same, same axes, same report, strategy one, strategy two. Um, and you can see that for Cash, cumulative cash flow in strategy six, it looks like, you know, if everything went probably possibly right that it could, you could um, have a cumulative cash flow of about $1,000 per hectare, but more realistically, it seems to hover at or below zero, while as um, strategy one seems to have a bit more even uh, cash flow, cumulative cash flow. We include yield over time. Again, strategy one on the left, strategy six on the right. Instead of deciles, these are comparisons of the most commonly observed values for that strategy in dark red. And the orange is what happens if you don't apply lime at all. So you can really see down on the bottom, these, it starts tapering off quite a bit when you don't actually apply any lime over those 20 years. And you can see that in this one in particular for strategy one versus strategy two, strategy or six, sorry, strategy six holds its yield much better in this crop rotation and this rotation. Each of these rotations is named after um, comic books and places because that was what my programmer decided to use for dummy variables. So, you know, it really is made up entirely. <laughs> Soil pH is also reported again, strategy one on the left. Uh, strategy six on the right, years on the x-axis, pH on the y-axis. The orange line, dotted line, is not applying any lime. Dark red, again, is applying lime. Again, both of these are the values that we observed most commonly for those two things that we looked at. And you can see the difference between just applying the one, the soil, the, the lime to the top and not actually incorporating it versus incorporating it. You really see it starts making a difference 
at these lower levels when you do incorporate it to 20 centimeters. We've been um, very cautious and trying to make sure that we get this right because we know a lot of this information is something that can be rather sensitive. We do have data sharing agreements um, that we do sign with everyone that wants to be part of the project. We have taken on board quite a bit of feedback from actual growers about the data sharing agreements to try to strike a good balance. So if you want to share something with us that doesn't have your geographic information, that's fine. You just have to give us a little bit more information, but we can still run the model. Um, but we want to make sure that you're absolutely comfortable with what we're doing with the data. Um, as I said, right now, only three of us have access to it. And once the project is done in March of 2025, we've agreed to actually delete all of the data at that time. What's next? Um, right now, the first report is due to go out at the end of this month to our first participant. It currently only has those seven liming strategies that I showed you that iLime builds in. I really want to see somebody, and a couple of farmers have expressed this interest. I've got this idea, and I really think that my strategy is going to you know, beat the socks off of everything else. And we want to see farmers actually give us their best bet strategy and run it through here to see how does it compare against some of these other things, against not liming, look at the cash flow, et cetera. We have that capability to do that. You don't have to just accept the defaults. It's very easy for us to just generate custom liming strategies. Precision solutions, right now we've just done this on a paddock by paddock basis, but there's no reason we can't do it on a precision sort of mapping basis. As long as all of the points are tied together, we can, we do have the flexibility, I should say, to do custom rates or incorporation here and not there. Uh, and that's something I think is really exciting. I'd really like to, to see somebody come to us and be interested in doing that because it'd be a good challenge for my developer to try to work some of that stuff in. I think we've done a good enough job of building the flexibility around the model that we can easily accomplish this, which is why I'm standing up here saying, please do come talk to us, talk to um, GGA, Michelle Condi is here um, and Axis Tech, they're, they're largely the face of this project. And I want to see more tailored strategy results. We've got some good data coming in from the current farmer. Um, there was some data bits and pieces missing. I just can't stress enough, the more data you can give us that you're willing to give us, the more tailored to your operation the results will be. We chose liming. Um, probably people questioned it quite a bit when they saw we were doing liming. Why on earth are you doing liming? This is silly. It's not a sexy topic. Um, but we really think it's one of those that really needed the attention. And we had certainly the expertise and the model at our disposal and what we've been able to accomplish so far has really worked out well for us. So we're rather encouraged by what we're seeing. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Adam. Um, have we got any questions for Adam? Just a quick one, maybe. No, I've, I've got one, Adam. Um, you might have got it before from farmers, but is there any interest in doing a, the, the same kind of thing for gypsum when you're thinking about that? Um, and, you know, soil sodicity and amelioration. Yeah. Yes, I have had, have had that question. Um, so right now, this is this is a proof of concept that was basically around getting farmers to see the value and getting their data organized and getting it off the farm. And liming was the first one we chose. But the bigger picture was we wanted to build a modeling framework that we could say gypsum or do I invest in buying that new tractor or do I you know, hire some new help and make those longer term decisions. So we're trying to build something that we can incorporate. We've got a couple different models at Deeper that I'm looking at that I'd really like to work into this framework. Gypsum isn't one of them yet, but that's not something that would be out of the question. Excellent. Thank you. So any any questions? Yeah, Brett, I'll just give you the mic. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. So it looks like what what you showed, you just pointed out that it's only at the field level, but it looks like it's an it has an ability, you're saying that you could you could take in yield map data and maybe do it on a zone level. Like by the look at that thing. If you yeah, can, we could rejig everything how we run it and run it on a zone level. As long as the sampling for the soil is done along yep. those lines. Yeah. Yes. So you could accept that much data into it and yep. process it. Right. Yeah. It just take longer to run, but we can we can do it. Right now it takes us a couple hours and we run generate about 
30 something million rows of data with the current farm. Uh, and that's seven locations, but we're working on optimizing things and whatnot. So. Cool. Excellent. Thanks for that, Adam. So next up, we've got um, Cameron Clark, a colleague from the University of Sydney and a bit of a change of scenery. Now we're going to be talking about livestock production. So yeah, Cameron's uh, from the Dairy Science Group at the University of Sydney. Um, he's an associate professor there in livestock production and, and welfare as well. And he's actually the animal agriculture theme lead within our Sydney Institute of Agriculture. Um, so his team's research is aimed at using precision livestock management to improve operational efficiency and animal welfare and livestock production systems. And today he's going to talk about preci precision dairy management, the status lessons and our next steps. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. So yes, precision dairy management, status lessons in our next step. So I'm the not so pretty face in front of what I'm about to talk about today and just acknowledging everyone in the group that you see up there right now from the PhD candidates that are all standing around me there uh, to Dominique van der Sag, Anna Chilangari and Peter Thompson and Sabrina Lomax who there, uh, they're all the people behind this work and I get to present on their behalf. I'm lucky enough to do that and come over to Western Australia to do it. So very lucky. So our expertise is really in precision livestock farming, focusing in on animal behavior and welfare, uh, also in pain in livestock and also in data science. So yeah, here we go. So just acknowledging the traditional owners of Australia and recognizing continu continuing connection to land, water and culture. And I live on work on the lands of the Thorwell and Durag people of your nation. I'm just paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So this presentation today is in two parts. Um, briefly, a background and, and our challenge, why I come to work uh, every day. And then secondly, our part, our work partnering with AgTech uh, companies. So that's specifically the, the Dairy Up program, which is a new program of work going in, in New South Wales now. New, it's been going for about one and a half years, but it's the largest dairy research development program in, in New South Wales and super proud to be part of that. So I just thought I'd start uh, with our challenge and I really like this overview uh, of our challenge um, of our challenges by Harowitz and, and Edie from CSIRO and it shows the mega trends impacting Oz agriculture over the coming 20 years. I'm just noting that's close to 10 years ago now when this was developed so we're 10 years in already but I'd still think that a lot of this is still relevant that we're heading towards that 9 billion 10 billion people and our animal source protein is a it will, pay, will play a huge part in that and super proud that our animal source protein a lot of that's exported uh, into international countries as well but also our expertise is also uh, exported the, the farmers in the audience here through the levy funds have have trained people up like all the people that you saw on that uh, beginning slide and that expertise is, is helping a lot in developing countries around that animal source protein as well so not only is our knowledge hopefully benefiting farmers here but just to say that we're having a big impact on international stage as well we're heading towards a wealthier world which is a, a big thing around animal source protein and we know know that a higher income typically leads to more meat consumption so it's not like we're going to go out of work anytime in the future all those that are to do with animal source protein production Obviously, we're going to have a bumpier ride in terms of the, the climate that we're seeing. And we see that all over Australia right now. And I'm just noting what's happening here in Western Australia right now. So that's obviously part of our lives going forward. But we're also with uh, cheesy customers. So there's these information-empowered consumers. Uh, provenance is obviously a big thing. So, um, yeah, so all those go together uh, to, to show us a challenge. But we've also got these transformative technologies at our hand now. And we've seen a lot of those now, but just to say that there's a, if you like, almost a glut of ag tech available now, particularly in the livestock space. Um, and I'll just show you what I mean about that in a second. A glut um, is a great thing for me as a scientist in terms of monitoring the animal, uh, but it also is a challenge to our farmers as well in terms of selection of that ag tech and, and whether that actually translates to an action. I really like the decision, um, decision technology, what was it before? Precision Precision technology, but I really like that term earlier, uh, decision technology, and that's something that I'm super keen on as well. So just for this uh, presentation today, I just thought I'd present a slide that just shows you the ag tech use in the Australian dairy industry. And this is some work by Nico Lyons, who's now working over in um, Dairy NZ. But 
hopefully this works without it turning off. Yes. So you can see here along the x-axis is the type of technology that our farmers are surveyed around their use, the use, the type of technology. But then along the y-axis is the, the size of the farm as well. So all the amount of farms actually using that technology. But as you go from a lighter colored bar to a dark colored bar, it shows you smaller farm sizes up to larger farms. This is around 100 cows per farm here through to around greater, greater than around 700 cows per farm. So there's a couple of takeaways from that, that there's obviously some technologies that have been taken up a lot in our industry, uh, but typically for any technology, there's an increased use uh, for farm size. That's the amount of cows per farm. Uh, the couple of takeaways from that. So I'd like to think, I'll try to explain why that is. If you like going from that left-hand side where there was automatic cut removers on the left-hand side, your left-hand side over to the right-hand side where you had something like scales there. We have this data collection on a farm that's operating well with their technology, leading through to some form of analysis, leading through to that decision agricultural decision um, action, then translating that through to more food, better environment or animal health and less wastage. We collect that data and round around we can. And typically on our dairy farms, the gap in this cycle often happens off this right-hand side. And this is why those automatic cut removers in that example, I, I'd suggest that's why those automatic cut removers are, are taken up a lot in our dairy industry and in that you've got the flow rate of milk and that's leading through to those automatic cut removers taking off those cups in an optimal time. So saving labor, you're not over or under milking, you're leading through to more food production at the end of the day. But the other, the other, other point uh, of that takeaway in terms of the numbers of cows per farm that I showed you on that slide. There's also that trend in technology use for the numbers in terms of positive association between number of cows per farm and the uptake of technology on farm. So I thought I'd put together here a piece that shows the number of cows per farm. This is a trend line for the number of cows in New Zealand, which is the top line, and the number of cows per farm in Australia, which is the bottom line. And you can see I just linearly extrapolated out in terms of that line and where the New Zealand dairy industry are rapidly heading towards 500 cows per farm in around 2030. We'll probably be reaching that target a little bit later around 20 years post when New Zealand gets there. And interestingly, both the slopes of those lines is around 13 cows per farm per year. But if you take up, if you take up that slide before in terms of technology use and the numbers of cow per farm and this farm, you could say that this slide here actually mirrors the overall uptake of ag tech in our Australian dairy industry. So there's a, there's a rapid uptake of, of ag tech in our Australian dairy industry. So here's just the slide in terms of the explosion uh, in ag tech providers that, is, that has occurred over the recent 10 years uh, in our industry. Uh, when we started operating in this area, if we just take cattle herd management, there are probably one or two uh, operating in that space. And now there's around 20, 27 uh, operating in that one space. So you can see there that our farmers, this is a, if you like a glut, or well, there's a lot of decisions to make around the ag tech that's used on the farm. I say on the slide, it's great for me, uh, but for farmers that, that brings in a question around the interoperability of their technology um, and the integration of that technology, depending on what you're looking to do from it. So if, as a scientist, the last 10 years have been absolutely wonderful in terms of what we can pull or the information that we can get from our, from our dairy systems. Uh, so it's been, it's been great for us. So our research program then goes off that right-hand side. We're going further to the right there. Um, we take this data analysis and we look at the diversity in the populations that we have there for our cattle. So we're looking at these data-driven models and the extremes in the population and how they do what they do. We then also partner with our technology providers. We're definitely not in the business of creating ag tech because we believe that there's a lot of that out there to exploit. So we partner with our tech, tech those tech providers in terms of the analysis that we do um, to drive this cycle around uh, to, to lead to hopefully more food, animal and environmental health. So this, this is, I'm motoring along here. So Patrick, probably doing pretty well on time. Uh, for this one. So our work partnering with ag tech companies. So I just thought I'd break this last part of the talk up into two sections. And that's really focusing in on our on or an, on or in animal ag tech. And that's focused in on aiding on-farm decision-making um, and collating that data also and focusing in on, on that welfare space. And the second part of the part 
of this presentation. We'll be looking at the dairy feed base, spatial and temporal variability, and the ag tech that's enabled us to produce that 28,000 litres of milk per hectare, equivalent to around 2,100 kilos of milk solids per hectare from our homegrown feed on the University of Sydney dairy farm. And those levels of production are, are more than double um, and are, are out of the highest that have been reported uh, globally. So just, yeah, it'll be exciting to show you the ag tech that we've used to, to enable that. And it might not be what you think. So here's just an overview of our on or in animal monitoring program. So the major partner that we've had over the past 10 years, the partner then was called SCR, which then was acquired by Allflex, given their interest in ETAG uh, technology. And our recent partner is with SmaxTech. So we've gone from that collar-based system that you see there on, on the cow, where I'm looking very almost same now, I'd like to think, uh, over the 10 years. Um, this is the, the cow that I named Anna for the Sydney Morning Herald, just after my daughter. It wasn't actually Anna, but I named her that. And then we've got this ear tag technology. So we've gone from this collar-based technology through to this ear tag-based technology, and this is some work that we've done in feedlot. Now we're looking at this technology now where we've got a bolus in the, uh, the rumen of cattle that monitors rumen temperature every 10 minutes of every day of every year. Um, so this is the data that we've collected. So down the bottom here, I've got another slide. Sorry about the size of this. The next slide will show you this as a, as a blown up state, but the data here refers to this technology here and that's really focused on the behavior monitoring. So if you like what's happening, what we're, enable, what we're able to do now is monitor the day in the life of a cow in data. So you see here, Here's all the behavior states that we're now monitoring and we've validated a lot of these and they're pretty accurate, uh, to be honest. And you can see here is a day in the life of a couple of cows in our herd. These green parts here are eating or grazing. You can see here that we're offering two breaks of pasture every day. There's higher levels of activity as the cows walk to get their pasture. There's levels of rumination or bouts of rumination in between. So you can see here that now we've got a cow in data. Uh, which is which is unbelievable and it saves us going out there or saves my students going out there and monitoring cows 24 hours a day in terms of behavior observations so just a few things just really skipping briefly over this on animal or in animal stuff we've published quite a bit on the use of these those behavior states and compiling compiling them to benefit farmers around the prediction of calving for cows just the early on work that we did around, and this is the primary focus of that technology is around estrus detection. Obviously our cows need to give birth to produce milk. So um, this is just around the accuracy of the that estrus monitoring system, which was the collar-based device. We showed that it had equal levels of accuracy to us being out there in the field, monitoring those cows 24 hours a day with observations. So, and, and also by taking uh, milk progesterone samples. So the, the technology is doing a wonderful job in terms of monitoring uh, estrus. So they're just a couple of, I can just go on. I could have done the whole presentation on some of that work, but I thought I'd just focus on some of this really exciting uh, new work that we're doing where we're focusing in on this diversity index uh, for each animal. And this is not really focused on, on dairy so much, or just it could be cattle as a whole, or actually any any production animal, to be honest, but we were tasked there to look at objective measures of welfare for our industry. And this is there's some exciting results where we're using what's called the diversity index um, by Miller, uh, which published in 2020. And for all these different states, we're showing that this diversity index is actually increasing. So this is around cow, cow calf separation. This is around heat stress. This is around dehorning. This is around castration and this is around dehorning and castration. So for every single one of those states, this H index was uh, increasing or the periods of stress resulted in greater behavioral diversity. In other words, we're getting towards this objective measure of welfare, um, which is really quite important for our industry when we come back to getting this data to back up what we're doing on farm. So this is super exciting for us. And also we, we looked at the proportion of time spent in each of those states, again, for each of those, if you like, procedures. And we showed that there's differences in the amount of resting and activity um, that those animals were doing with lower levels of stress um, corresponding to high levels of resting, as you'd expect, and also the high levels of stress corresponding to high levels of activity. So these data are really corresponding to what you would expect, but it's really putting a number to that for our industry to benchmark off. So that was super exciting. And that's the first time that that data has been show, shown. 
So just around the ag tech, enabling these super high levels of, of production, just to say that partial utilization and farm profit are almost always linked in our dairy industry with a sequential decline in the amount of partial utilization associated with input losses, uh, with grazing management or harvesting at a different rates from what the growth rate is, overgrazing, inaccurate allocation, and substitution where we're offering too much supplement in the system. We estimate that we, we lose around 60% of the overall amount of pasteurization that we could get through accumulation of each one of these factors on farm. So it's not one or the other. We need all those in the suite to get these very high levels of pasteurization. Five minutes. Thanks. Uh, so here's just the ag tech that we use there. And I guess it's, it's not fancy. Um, just to say that we've just been using a, a rising plate meter uh, to get all those results that I showed you before around the highest levels of, if you like, production per hectare from homegrown feed. And this is this is because from some of the early work that we did, we showed the variability between paddocks and between years was really, really large. So we're getting 100% difference in the amount of pasture that we grow between the worst performing paddock and our best performing paddock on dairy farms. And this translates across almost any farm that we deal with, whether this work was in New Zealand, Yanni Garcia in our group has done the same thing in Australia. Almost any dairy farm that you go to, there's going to be a hundred percent difference in the amount of growth that happens between the worst performing paddock and the top performing paddock. This top graph here is a research farm. The bottom one is a really, really top operated commercial farm in New Zealand. You can see that for a research farm, we skew that, we shift that curve to the right through how we manage it compared to our commercial farm. So the couple of take home messages from this um, work that we did, and this is back that I did in back in 2010, it emphasizes the need for the regular monitoring of pasture cover and thinking twice before taking pastures out, paddocks out producing 22 ton of hectare, 22 ton of dry matter per hectare out for a crop. And quite a few of our farmers are actually taking out those really top performing paddocks for a crop that produces just about as much as what the pasture is growing. And that's, that's in our opinion, a big mistake. So our opinion is that we should be taking out these lower performing paddocks like we do in this research situation and shifting them up, up that curve through cropping, through the removal of limitations like compaction or whatever it might be through, through cropping. So just to summarize some of the results that we got out of that feed-based work, 26 tonne of dry matter per hectare utilized across the two years of the study with a forage mean of 10.2 megajoules of ME and a CP a 20.5 and just saying this is the amount of production that we got off that just using the, a very simple form of ag tech. So the take home message from that is that simple ag tech enables timely, enabling timely management decisions got us a very, very long way. And we'd be very hard pushed around precision ag to go past what we're doing with the plate meter. But I'd suggest that we've got an awesome opportunity to take that next step now. And we're doing that in the Dairy Up program, which is all there. And I'm noting Patrick standing up, so I'm out of time. Um, but the satellite to uh, derive spectral uh, data is what we're using now. And we're asking the question, can we use satellite derived measures of pasture cover to minimize that plate meter use whilst maintaining accuracy? And I note the reports coming out, uh, particularly for WA around species, soil types and canopy closure around the use of satellite data, particularly for those uh, for pastures. And what we're doing now is working on a blended model between plate and satellite. But our work has also shown there's also an opportunity to minimize the time uh, taken for that plate meter use as well around how you actually utilize it across the farm and the route that you take. So there's a big challenge for the satellite to do better than what we're already doing with our plate meter. So just to summarize, and here's a conclusion for you, Patrick. Um, we're just on the tip of the iceberg. So we've got these new animal phenotypes now being arrayed. Uh, revealed from the array of ag tech now available. And that'll play a key role. And you'll see it coming through now in terms of the cows that we select and taken together these data now form the basis of monitoring the welfare across contexts, which positions our industry really well in terms of risk um, and our license to operate with society. And I just say that before the rocket science, we can get a very long way with simple feed-based ag tech in our dairy industry. And there's a lot of information out there now as to how to get there. Data integration and collaboration across the domain of precision ag now key. And that's why it's so fantastic uh, to be here and get the invite to be here and present and listen to you all now. Um, and the secret is it's, it's really not around ag tech 
uh, new data creation. It's all about that integration, integration and collaboration for us. So yeah, on behalf of everyone that you see there, uh, thank you so much to everyone, to Angelique and to Brett uh, for helping organize me to get over here. It hasn't been that easy. Um, and to Patrick for chairing the session. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Cameron. Have you got any questions for Cameron? No, well, I've got one. Yeah, one. Oh, we got one over there, yeah. I'll, I'll go there, Brett. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks. Um, just wondering whether drones would be a middle step between pasture plates and satellites. Uh, that's a that's a really good question. I, I think um, yes, yeah, could be. But I think I think that blended model of of satellite and and plate meter is the way to go. Having said that, the first job I ever got given as a scientist was actually in New Zealand. Um, and it was to fill the gaps between images of, of satellite image. And uh, the issue there, as you'd expect, in the long, land of the long white cloud, uh, they had cloud cover issues. So dr drone drone tech would definitely be an option there. But yeah, I, I guess the answer is it depends on how much cloud cover you got is the answer to that. Any more questions yet, Brent? Cameron, you, you, I'm, I'm, this, this is going to test your memory, maybe mine, but there, there was a New Zealand instrument that was pulled behind a motor, um, a, a quad bike, that was using ultrasound, I think, to measure the height or, of the pasture. Does, has that disappeared or has it stopped? Oh, still around, uh, CDAX. Uh, CDAX, so that's that was actually out of Massey Uni, I think, and, it, and it's I think it's uh, just light, just shining a light straight across and looking at the interception of the canopy with the light. Yeah. Definitely an option to to minimise that plate meter use, but I've got to say that I could almost walk around a farm as quick as I would take for a CDAX to get in and out of the gate. Uh, but I think there's a there's an opportunity with CDAX around that within paddock variability. Like I said, there there's a hundred percent difference between the worst and best performing paddocks on farm. Even within a paddock, there's a hundred percent difference within a paddock. Uh, you know, depending on what spot you're at. Our challenge is, and that's what I'm keen to hear now is, would would I want to invest? If I was going to invest in that, I want to make sure that I can actually change my action to capitalize on it within a paddock. So I, I would need I need to know that I could change my nitrogen fertilizer application on a on a meters two meter application basis, or you know what's the action that I'm going to change based on that information. And at the moment, we're operating at a paddock scale, um, and you can get around the farm pretty quickly to be honest with a plate meter. Cool. All right. We'll just thank Cameron then. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. So last speaker before we um head off for a coffee break is uh Julia Payne from Bayas and she's a customer activation specialist there. She's gonna give us a bit of an industry update. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here and listen to all of these amazing talks on various different topics and I'm really pleased to have a spot here today. My name is Julia Payne and I work in Bayer's digital farming team. My role is to raise awareness for Bayer's digital farming platform, FieldView, and to onboard new growers across Western Australia and South Australia as a newly launched product to the Australian market after years of success in over 20 odd countries across the world. I'm really excited to be here today to, to learn more about the work that's being done in the precision ag space with the ever increasing adoption of new farming practices and technologies. I think though, when you consider the work that's being done in the space, there still is a gap in terms of collection of data across mixed fleet operations. And the key message that I'd like to get across today is that leveraging tools such as Bayer's FieldView product could help to bridge that gap between data collection from mixed fleet operations and ultimately increasing the adoption of precision agriculture. I've been spending a lot of time actually over the last year 
talking to growers and agronomists and industry reps. And there's a really key message that's coming out from these people that there's a lot of growers who have a mixed fleet of machinery. And that's for various different reasons, whether they have inherited farms and the machinery has come with it, or they choose to maintain a mixed fleet of different colored machines. But the clear message is that there continues to be a gap in the data collection, transfer and compatibility of this data across the various different brands. And there's also been limited affordable options on the market to bridge that gap and to really resolve that pain point. So what does that actually mean for growers and agronomists in the industry? When considering variable rate for different paddocks or for their whole operation, I guess this is not a representation of every single grower situation, but the ones we've been speaking to is that the agronomist is typically the one who is creating the prescription map. Then the grower is putting that into a machine. They're completing the application, but the agronomist really rarely has visibility of the application happening and the, act the accurate data, particularly if there's contractors involved or if there's multiple machines or different colored machines operating with different file formats that don't always talk to each other. This same issue is then arising again at harvest time. So the growers and the agros are spending a lot of time getting data together from different machines or programs so that the agro can do analysis on the variable rate work that's being done. By the time this data is coming back, the grower is thinking about the next season and not always engaging with the results of that variable rate work. And I think, although that's not a representation of every single grower's journey, I think we could probably all agree that improvements can be made in this process so that we can help to increase the adoption of precision agriculture technologies. So throughout my launch process and talking to lots of growers over the last year of our launch here, this scenario I've just explained is where we see our fit in the market. So Fieldview is an easy to use tool for growers to collect seeding, application and harvest data into one place, no matter the machine color. Our standout feature of Fieldview is our brand agnostic in nature, which helps growers to integrate and then interact with that data so that they can make decisions about where products are going to go and um, how much they're going to use and when they should use it. Historically, I think um, all growers or lots of growers have been tied to proprietary systems of specific manufacturers, and it's been hard to integrate that data across their mixed fleet operations. We have growers that are using FieldView to start to bridge the gap between that data collection and have visibility across various different parts of their operation that they haven't been able to tie together into one source before. And we also have agronomists who they've been saying to us, we very rarely have all of our growers running the same systems. And they've identified FieldView as a potential way to get data that's accurate that they haven't had access to before. So with all of that in mind, I do have an example today of a grower on his journey with not only FieldView, but Precision Ag in general. So I just want to paint the picture of this grower for you today. He inherited his farm from his father and he doesn't have any young people on his farm driving the precision or the data side of things. He doesn't have new machines or the latest technology and he certainly is far from considering himself as progressive or an innovator. I was talking to him last year and he said to me, I just, I know I could be doing more with my data to improve the performance of my farm on a paddock by paddock basis. And he said, he said to me, I feel like I'll be left behind if I don't do something. But he said to me, my cedar doesn't have a rate controller. I have a green sprayer, yellow headers, red tractors with retrofitted screens and guidance. He said, how could I possibly validate the variable rate work that I'm doing when none of these systems are aligning? So after discussions last year, he decided to give FieldView a go and he gave the caveat that he's not amazing with computers or phones and he'd need a little bit of hand-holding through that process. So I helped him last year get set up on FieldView and he mapped his harvest with a FieldView drive. 
And he was really pleased to be able to validate what his farmer instinct was, but he wasn't able to actually see that in a map before because of the structure of his, his business. And I think where the real success of this story comes in is he actually mapped his seeding layer this year with, with the Fieldview Drive as well. And within paddocks, he did four different treatments. So he doesn't have the latest machines, but he's doing trial work and he's now understanding what different treatments could be could be doing for his field in order to improve his performance. We've still since walked through his field with him and I've shown him the field health imagery side of things and scouting, dropping pins, and he's seeing the variations within his field in a tool that's easy to use for somebody who said he couldn't even answer FaceTime on his phone. So I think he's doing pretty well. And I think this is a really good example of how FieldView was an enabler for him to start on his journey, to start making decisions about what he can do to improve his farm and look at the variations within the paddocks. And when it comes down to it, I think that's what precision agriculture is as a whole. So I guess with all of that in mind, there are challenges in the industry with data compatibility and visibility across different brands. And I think there's a lot of growers who wanna get started with their journey. And there are problems and we can identify that, but FieldView has been an enabler and there's other tools in the market that can do the same kinds of things to start people who don't necessarily fall into that early adopter category, but they can actually start making changes and precision agriculture can be accessible to them. So I hope if this is of interest to you, we also have a stand here today and we're happy to help and I'm also really keen to start listening to more guys speaking over the next couple of days and learn some more. Thank you. Thanks for that Julia. Very nice industry update and if you're interested in some of the issues that Julia was talking about um, just then we've actually got an industry round table tomorrow afternoon um, talking about interoperability and things like that. So that is the end of, of this first session. It was a nice diversity of talks, I think. And, um, you know, we're only six minutes late, so that's pretty impressive. So I think we're going to kick off at 3.30 again. So we're going to head out there and have some afternoon tea and, um, yeah, get back in here by 3.30. Cheers. Thank you. We'll just thank all the speakers as well. Cheers.
Afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks all for coming in straight after afternoon tea. This is our session to get us through to our afternoon drinks. Um, so I'll be your chair for this afternoon. I'm Dale Kirby. Uh, I work with uh, Local Land Services in New South Wales and with the Spark Committee as well. Um, so we've got a great lineup this afternoon. We're starting with Ken Flower from the Australian Herbicide Research, or sorry, Resistance Institute. Yeah. Sorry, Ken. Um, Ken's worked in research, extension, and teaching in crop agronomy, weed control, controlled traffic, and precision ag. He's currently the director of the Australian Herbicide Resistance Initiative, and his presentation this afternoon is on soil water mapping using electromagnetic induction. So thanks, Ken. Thanks very much. Uh, as uh, mentioned, my name is Ken Flower, and um, I work at UWA. And I've recently taken on the role in uh, ARI, the Australian Herbicide Resistance Initiative. Uh, the work I'll be presenting um, this afternoon is based on some earlier work that we did uh, from one of our PhD students. And it's using soil water mapping, using uh, EMI, electromagnetic induction, uh, to map soil water. And my co-authors are Hera Schaukert and Matthias Leopold. So uh, this research was part of HERA's uh, PhD research, and it was done over a number of different sites uh, in very different soil conditions. So from uh, deep sands to duplexes, and the results I'll be presenting today are just from one of those sites, and that was at Cunderdon on red land, uh, loamy soil, sandy loam soil. Uh, the photo there is of Hera, um, and she's got the EMI, the EM uh, instrument, Instrument on a sled uh, pulled behind a ute. So that's basically how we did the EM mapping, which is what most uh, PA agronomists would use of some sort. Uh, the work was published in the Agricultural Water Management, and um, that's uh, what I'll be talking about today. So as I mentioned, the trial was done at uh, Cunderdon uh, in the Wheat Belt in WA. And it was cited at the uh, Ag College there at Cunderdon. And it was part of a rotation trial, a long-term rotation trial, where we mapped uh, the soil water in the trial. I selected this just as an example of some of the um, use of this instrument uh, because we had different rotations or we were following different rotations that enable us to look at uh, variations in soil water uh, across those different treatments. So this is the rotation trial. Uh, it mainly had four rotations. I won't spend too long on them because there are just a couple of areas I thought it'd be interesting to focus on. So our four treatments were firstly continuous cereal and they were three-year rotations. So we had uh, wheat, wheat, barley. We had a diverse rotation, uh, wheat, uh, and then lupin and then canola, and then uh, monoculture wheat. So uh, at the time of the survey, that was about... I think it was 12 years of continuous wheat. And then we had what we called a farmer rotation, which was uh, two cereals, so wheat, barley, and then a break, a break crop. And in those three years, when we did the survey, um, that break was fallow. So uh, we had a fallow in there. Now, uh, I've got that diagram at the base. And it's I've got the plot numbers there, but it's just really to illustrate, I've got two uh, plots there that I particularly wanted to focus on, well, in fact, three, the two in the red are the two fallow plots, so plot 104 is a fallow and then 206, um, and we have fallow canola lupin, <clears throat> and then the next plot was a split plot where we had uh, continuous wheat, um, as I said, over 12 years, and then we had a pasture in there.
So looking at the at the trial, um, we started uh, surveying at plot 104, and um, the plots were fairly large, so 40 meters wide by 80 meters long. And you can see it was fallow, uh, canola, and then the lupin. Uh, this is a drone photo of, of those plots um, in the in the middle of the season. So uh, I've circ put a yellow sort of line around where we started the mapping, and then it went on for the rest of the trial. The, that whole trial ran for about 800 meters, so a fairly large trial. And so you can see the fallow plot there, and then the canola plot, and then at the bottom of the picture is the lupin plot. So the uh, EM survey was done using a dual M uh, to measure the electrical conductivity apparent of the soil. And uh, that dual particular instrument measured at four different depths. It measured at zero to 30 centimeters, zero to 50, zero to 80, and then zero to 160. And then we used um, some software EM for soil to do um, that inversion. And after that, then we could actually take out the depth slices. Uh, we didn't use the top depth, 0 to 30, because uh, the instrument was sitting uh, on a sled, so a bit off the soil, and it was also very dry when we did it, so the readings were close to 0. Um, so we discarded that data. So we just used the 0 to 50, and then the other depth slices we could take out were 50 to 80 centimeters and 80 to 160. So essentially what we're trying to do there is to predict the uh, volumetric soil water in each of those depth slices. Uh, this just shows how we traverse the plots. Um, we uh, Each plot, as I said, was about 40 meters and we went up and down four times um, and then through the rest of the trial. The survey I'll report on today um, was done in autumn uh, 2019, so before seeding, so the soil was fairly dry at that stage. Now, in each plot, we had a neutron probe or two neutron probe access tubes, and I've sort of circled them here. The yellow dots showing the neutron probe access tube, and then you can see how we ran adjacent to each of those um, as we traversed the plots. And I've with that circle I've put around there, that was uh, later on, I'll show you some data comparing the neutron probe with the, with the EM data. And we took data within a certain radius uh, of that neutron probe access tube to do those comparisons. The soil water was measured uh, by Phil Ward, CSIRO, um, and Phil was measuring the soil water every month uh, for those, the, actually the whole, time of that trial over 12 years, but every month was measured at 20 centimeter intervals down to 1.6 meters. So um, as well as doing that EM survey, uh, we measured, uh, took soil samples down to uh, at those different depths. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at the time of that survey, we couldn't get down to 1.6 meters. The soil was too hard. Um, so we only got down to 100 centimeters. We did chemical analysis, uh, measured the conductivity, pH, um, et cetera, and uh, then normal nutrient analysis. Subsequently, we did uh, calibrations uh, to develop a calibration for the EM measurements. That's the apparent electrical conductivity measured by the EM instrument against resistivity. So the calibration we developed was resistivity against volumetric soil water. And then uh, we developed those for two of those depths and um, the deeper soil sample where we couldn't get down to 1.6 meters, uh, we just used the 50 to 80 centimeter depth. Uh, this shows the sort of lab calibration that we used to uh, calibrate the EM measurements or the electrical conductivity measurements uh, to calibrate those with the uh, soil water content. So it was done in a controlled temperature room. Uh, we got a subsample of each of those soil depths uh, or a number of subsamples, and we compacted them in, in a container to approximate the bulk density in the field. It was wet up 
um, with uh, deionized water, and then we inserted electrodes at one centimeter intervals, and then we measured the resistivity. And you can see that that little container is sitting on an automatic balance, so it's measuring weight loss as um, the container loses water, obviously we can measure then the weight change. So it's like gravimetrics or water. So we're measuring the loss of water through weight change. And then uh, at simultaneously measuring the resistivity. So we've got an idea then of the resistivity of the soil uh, and uh, the volumetric soil water content. Uh, this gives you an idea of um, the, some of the data that uh, comes out in terms of the calibrations, just one of the examples. And um, on the y-axis, we've got volumetric water soil water content and percent against the resistivity. And we know that conductivity is the inverse of resistivity. The higher the resistance, uh, the lower the conductivity. So um, when we end up with, um, as our soil water content drops, we know that we get an increase in the soil resistivity or drop in the conductivity because they're inversely related. I should point out also in the, in the document um, that you've got the proceedings, um, there's an error in the, in the measurement. I've got, it's got centimeter cubed per centimeter cubed. Uh, that's an error there, it should be a percent volumetrics or water content. Um, so these are some of the results for that um, for that particular sample that we did. Um, we've got the volumetric soil water content, red being very low, 0 to 5%, going up to uh, 30 to 40% at the bottom in the dark blue. And these are for the different depth slices. So we've got um, the top depth slice, which is uh, 0 to 0 0.5 meters, uh, 0.5 to 0.8 is the next one, and then 0.8 to 1.6 meters being at the bottom. I just wanted to point out two of the things here. I think you can see quite clearly, particularly in the two deeper depths, you can see the effect of, fallow, of the fallow there. So that fallow is conserving soil water across uh, to that next season. So this is basically at planting of the next crop. Um, the other thing that was of interest there, um, we see that um, at the end here, there seemed to be less soil water, and that was following the continuous cereal. I've got the other plot here, which I think you can just see it here, where we've got that split plot. And we you couldn't notice it at the at the shallower depths, but at the deeper depth, you can see there's more soil water, con higher soil water content particularly in that pasture, because this was split, the side was wheat and the other side was pasture. So you can see uh, where we had the pastures conserve more soil water. And the reason for that was because it was quite weedy, uh, we sprayed it out uh, in about August. And so there was more soil water carried over in that particular subplot there. So I think it's really the main aim of this talk was just to show that um, you can potentially use that uh, EM survey uh, mapping to map your soil water, and you can separate it out in the different depth slices. It would have been particularly useful if we had the 0 to 0 0.3, uh, so then you could have the top 30 centimeters, all the different depth slices there. Uh, comparing the volumetric soil water content um, in percent against those, we've got those three depth slices compared to the neutron moisture meter, the EM shown in the green and the neutron moisture meter in the yellow there. You can see there's a good correlation in the surface. Uh, it's reasonable here. And then it does drop off a bit here where we're getting higher estimated soil water content with the EM compared to the neutron moisture meter. And that could be because um, slightly higher, maybe salinity in that deeper depth. Uh, we didn't get down to that depth, unfortunately, at the time of sampling. So uh, we didn't have the actual soil samples to develop those calibrations for that specific depth. But generally, uh, pretty good results then. Just finally, uh, possibilities for the future. Uh, obviously, it would be very useful to, um, if you've got these calibrations, to develop um, or to do a baseline survey after harvest so that you could determine your crop lower limit, uh, the volumetrics or water content at crop lower limit, and then 
any subsequent measurements uh, compared to that crop lower limit, you've basically got your uh, plant available soil water content in there. Potentially, it would be useful to develop calibrations for key APSOM or APSOIL sites. And so those could be loaded up um, on, on, uh, and used and available for anyone who then had those APSOIL sites uh, used for yield profit or something, uh, could potentially use that to estimate uh, plant water content uh, reasonably accurately. And then just throwing it out there for the future, I'm, I'm not a physicist, but um, the original idea and thought was that uh, if one of these instruments could be attached to a tractor, obviously there's issues with the metal, um, but I know they can be attached to the back of a ute and shielded properly, uh, that every time a grower went over the field with a sprayer, um, that you could effectively measure your soil moisture content. And I think we saw from an earlier talks that it's plant available soil water that's really driving your yield. Um, that's all I have. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ken. Um, questions for Ken? No, that's a, it's a good question. I think that's been so far one of the limitations is that uh, with, I think it's known that, you know, with the EM instrument, um, it's measuring the electrical conductivity and it's highly correlated with soil water, but there's many other factors, soil texture, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yes, so the answer is you would have to, um, but this is where I think the calibration method is relatively easy. Uh, when done in the lab. So I think maybe that that could be very useful for growers. And that's what I was thinking, you know, to develop a library of uh, calibrations that could be used for the Epsom sites. Or even if you're a researcher, you've got a long-term trial um, and, you know, you could easily get a calibration for, th for that because your sites generally are selected to be uniform. And then uh, it's very quick to measure the EC, you know, using those instruments. So you've got a rapid measure of soil water uh, accurately down to depth, and you can take out your depth slices. You can see how crops are using water at different depths, et cetera. Thank you. Any other questions for Ken? All right. Um, thank you very much, Ken. If you can see Brett. Uh, our next speaker is Aidan Sinnott. Um, Aidan, I hope I didn't butcher your surname. Um, so Aidan's from VRT Solutions as the director, a company that works across the southwest Western Australia, providing data-driven strategies that focus on optimising crop management, resource allocation, and environmental impact. Aidan's going to talk today about the development the development of a high resolution geophysical model of WA soils for multifaceted use in the WA agricultural industries. Thanks, Aidan. Thank you. Um, everyone hear me okay? Um, good afternoon. Um, thanks for the opportunity with SPA to present this. Um, we took a Dutch master's student across uh, early last year. Uh, his name was Victor. Um, he was from the University of Wageningen. Um, and basically, we had an, we had uh, a hypothesis uh, based on our ten years of experience in uh, high resolution mapping in Western Australian soils, and we used Victor <laughs> to the bone <laughs> uh, to develop a model. Uh, but I'll go through that. Firstly, I'll just start with who we are. So um, you may or may not know who I am in terms of Western Australian uh, PA. But um, I started this industry niche, I'd say about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, um, with precision agronomics. And in about 2017 or 18, um, me and another couple of guys, uh, David Caporn and, and Jordan White, we're, we're all sort of business partners now where we um, adopt soil mapping strategies for the majority of the wheat belt. Um, across the last four, five or six years we've been softly acquiring more and more equipment and now we're pretty pretty well set up for uh 
yeah, broad acre farming. So just want to touch briefly on what we do and why we do it. That's probably mostly important. Um, so one of the strategies, I'll just go through the goals of the soil surveys. So the EEM and gamma radiometric soil surveys that we provide to our farmers and clients are become quite critical as the baseline maps that a lot of decisions are, are focused on. Um, they obviously optimize your inputs because they're derived from soil types and different soils have different requirements. Um, over a long period, of medium long period of time, they can help really optimize your budgeting and planning processes um, for a grower or a farm business time and labor, labor management is really, really important, especially when there's a staff shortage, uh, which we're facing in the current uh, environment. Um, it also gives you opportunities to maximize opportunities, sorry, to, you know, when fertilizer prices are cheap, to optimize the buying and uh, application rates um, based on your soil types and, you know, maintaining good strategies moving forward. Uh, you reduce your seasonal risks, you know, it's all spatially driven. Um, and hopefully minimize losses. Uh, just a tip to the hat, most of our soil data that we collect um, gets processed and we utilize PCT iCloud predominantly for our delivery of our soil maps to our clients. Um, in my opinion, um, it's honestly one of the best softwares on the market in terms of the precision ag space. And this is not an endorsement or an advertisement. <laughs> it really isn't. <laughs> anyway, so just just to put a little basics behind EM and gamma mapping and why we why we do what we do. So EM things that influence um, electromagnetic readings um, predominantly it's salt. You get very very high readings from high soil concentrations. Uh, clay content also affects the readings. Moisture, as Ken uh, was talking about, and also metals. So you can use it as a metal detector, but we're not gonna tell any of our clients about that. <laughs> and the gamma radiometrics is a very different type of sensor. It works in a very different plane. And uh, yeah, we like to run both sensors simultaneously because they both offer different aspects of your soil type and in WA we feel that it's very very important to cover off as many soil properties in one pass as possible um, things that influence gamma radiometrics uh, gamma radiometric signatures are um, the presence of moisture um, the soil texture as well or the clay content um, and also sands to rock so it's quite comprehensive but what's the point of differentiation between the two it's not influenced by salt that's a very big point of difference um it's a this is a cheat sheet i've had in a different presentation um over the course of the last year i've been speaking at different events um over the past 10 years of working in this space what i've found um dealing with many many clients uh, throughout the weep in terms of variable rate strategy um Soil sampling is critical. So you can do all the mapping you like, you can make it as cheap as you like, you make it as expensive as you like, but unless you go back and you take a soil sample, at this current time, it's very, very difficult to predict uh, soil properties. You can assume a lot, but you need to go back and soil test and ground truthing is actually a critical component to it. Um, in terms of strategies, these give you, the soil sampling gives you the calibration um, for your maps. So they can articulate where your zones need to be in terms of your application rates. Uh, so your variable rate line, it can depend on the geological parcel of Western Australia that you're in, which one is more prevalent, so your EM or your gamma layers. Uh, gypsum, 99% of the time in WA, it's related to your EM map. Um, your variable rate potassium application, um, nearly nine, 80 to 90% of the time, it's some layer in the EM or gamma radiometric field and sometimes we bolster that with a bit of yield data to really try and articulate zones that don't make any sense um phosphorus um yeah em and gamma works well in terms of a holistic farm planning process but um we do also look at 
yield data as a replacement strategy sometimes as well. Um, Vibrate nitrogen, it's been spoken about earlier. Uh, it's, in my opinion, it's an opportunistic approach. You don't always do it because sometimes farmers just don't feel like doing it. And that is uh, one of those opportunistic things that based on price and availability and soil water, et cetera. Uh, you can also use these maps for deep tillage, physical soil amelioration, all that sort of stuff. But routine soil monitoring is critical to your targets. So what you want to achieve, you want to make sure that whatever variable rate strategy you're adopting, that you you monitor it. Otherwise, you might be going, steering in the wrong direction, but not know it unless you quantify it. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now, the talk that I had was multifaceted models, but, and I know we're sick of models. There was only one model, really, and that's uh, Cindy Crawford. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm showing my age again. But, that's, <laughs> but anyway, so I put this in. What we did was I got Victor over. I worked him to the bone for six months, and we worked really hard on the hypothesis that we could develop a soil organic model Solid kind of carbon model for Western Australian soils. I was pretty confident because I'd seen repeated correlations between some of our high resolution data and the soil types and soil organic carbon levels. So I said, why not? So we've all heard of our models today. Um, a lot of it's very interesting, but the, the, the function of a model is to really have the greatest representation of something uh, with the least amount of error and that's the optimistic approach that's what you really want to get um the second type of modeling goals is to look like that guy really good looking guy tall handsome dutch accent speaks very good english but, but like i said he's a, yeah he was a different cat but what we tried to do was we tried to take WA we built apart into geological and geographical parcels and tease out these different sections and using background data such as what's freely available. This is all deep herd based database that started being surveyed back in the 80s or earlier. Um, it was all compiled. It's all freely available. You can find this on the web. Um, yeah, it's it's really, really valuable information and it's a great starting point for uh, land management. Um, so moving into the soil organics carbon space, um, I just wanted to point out this, that if we know we have potential soil organic carbon content, the sequestration situation, regardless of what you think about, you know, CO2 and whether you believe in it or not, it doesn't really matter. What we wanted to do was model what's in the soils. And that's really what we had the power to do. So what we have here is potential soil organic co content. And the defining factors of that are driven by clay content, bulk density, um, mineralogy, and the depth of profile. Um, I'll just, oh, sorry. I, I knew I drew squares around there. <laughs> um, the attainable one. That's more based around your climate. So your rainfall areas, the temperatures um, and the situation, that's your limited. That's, so that's your attainable SOC content. And your actuals come back to your on-farm management more so, so, such as your soil management, your agronomy rotations, your planning, your residues and your water usage, et cetera. So these are the three factors in your equation. If you can get two of them, you can get the other one. So this is how we did it. Um, we basically took a whole heap of data um, from a lot of soil surveys that we did. I'll go through that in a second, but additional covariates. So we took basically, I don't know if anyone's aware, but Western Australia has been mapped by an airplane. Um, and this airborne gamma radiometrics data set is practically free, freely available. The problem with it is that it's quite low resolution. It was mapped on two to 500 meter swath widths, and then it was down sampled to 80 to 90 meter pixels. So it's not quite the level that we're after, but it's there as a background that we can utilize somewhat. Um, we've got a quite a large selection of soil samples from across the wheat belt. We also have high res proximal sensed gamma radiometric surveys that we've completed at many locations across the wheat belt. 
We've also got some additional covariates such as EM, elevation, latitude, rainfall, isobars, all that sort of stuff. So we prepared all this data, jumbled it all into one thing, developed a regression. We worked on a model and then we recalibrated the model. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to get to the end point, then go back and then refine it and then do it again and go back and refine it and do it again. So once we'd done that a few times, we worked on prediction and that goes back to the clay content, all that stuff from the potential soil organic carbon. So the next step to that was to validate our soil organic map. And what we did was we started at a local, local level on farm, which you can do with, you know, directions of progress with soil organic carbon tests. And then extrapolate that out to WA. And then what we want to do then is make sure that our, our data and our information isn't nonsense either. So we want to cross validate that. So moving on to the actual project, this is, this is what we did. So these five locations in the Southwest corner of Western Australia, three are quite close together, relatively speaking. Uh, these are further away, obviously. But these are the areas and these, you know, it totals about, I think it was 42,000 hectares approximately um, of high resolution soil survey data uh, just in this project. And from those 42,000 hectares, there were 630 approximate soil cores taken to about a meter. Um, so what we did do, um, which is in nature of analyzing data from an independent point of view, is we removed 200, approximately 200 of those sites from our model and left them to one side and analyzed and created the model based on the other 430. And then we, once we developed the model, we chucked the 200 back in to see how close our model predicted those actual values. Just a note here too, uh, there's a couple of growers in the room that were actually part of this project, whether they knew it or not. Um, <laughs> But I did ask for permission to, to to look at this data. So no, thank you very much. It's been really a um, a valuable addition to, I think, to, to WA agriculture. I think this has got real potential moving forward. So just an example of one of the farms that we've developed. And I want to really stress the point here before I start going through this, this, this farm. Um, low resolution mapping and modeling has nowhere near the level of weight behind it compared to high resolution mapping. It just doesn't. And we've seen that with the yield stuff. Somebody was talking about a bit earlier as well. Um, but this, this is a, about a thousand hectares, um, this farm. And there's about 13 or 14 soil sample sites and these are all core to a meter. So this is the current soil organic carbon model that's internationally available on grids of 250 meter pixels. So the soil sample sites, which are actuals, are colored on the same scale as the prediction model. And as you can tell, the international model vastly overestimates, it estimates the, the soil organic carbon to be approximately 2%, where the actuals are much lower, generally. So that's the international model. The national model, the one that's currently used on 80 to 90 meter pixels is along the same vein. The, the, the pixels are actually quite broad. The resolution isn't quite there. And it also overestimates from the actuals quite dramatically. The problem with this I find is that, and I'm, feel free to correct me, but if, if somebody comes along and tells you that you need to start improving your carbon levels and you're already behind what they think you've got, then as a farmer, you're going to be on the back foot before you even start on your carbon sequestration program. Running through, this is what we came up with, which is far more practical, um, far more realistic, and actually aligns quite well if you look at the high points. Like the resolution needs to be improved, in my opinion, on the source sampling locations. We need to have more points, but it goes a long way. So high resolution really, really matters. 
So comparing that, I just the basic stats. Our model was a 10 meter resolution pixel. Our R squared across the wheat belt, once we extrapolate it, was between 0.25 and 0.4. And the, R, uh, the root mean square error was around 0.5% on average, which isn't great, but it's our first draft and we only had one person working on it. So yeah, that's the difference. Um, but here we go. This is Victor's crowning moment. <laughs> But he was very proud of this. When we extrapolated this across the wheat belt to see what the model would look like, this is what it looked like. So this is a map at high resolution of potential soil organic carbon. Take what you want from that. But what we want to do with that is where do we go next? Okay, so we have this potential. We need another um variable in the formula so we need our potential we have our potential we have our actuals which is taken from the CSBP soil map um book from 2020 um so what the, that does if you take one from the other you can work out your attainable soil organic carbon moving forward now that means a lot if you really think about it Uh, future direction for farmers. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave that one open for discussion because there's lots of um, potential there. If you start talking about soil organic carbon and nitrogen and soil types and this and that, topography as well. But the resolution is key to moving forward. So just key findings that we found out, low resolution modeling, it's high error. Um, high res much lower. And the low resolution modeling actually had a negative R squared, which I didn't even know was a thing. Um, but high resolution had a positive R squared. Um, the correlation, we've, we established it between soil carbon levels and a combination of high resolution covariates, which is EM, gamma, elevation. And then we'll probably move into others, such as rainfall, et cetera. Um, we also believe, due to the fact that we tried running some eastern state models on this, that Western Australian soil is being so diverse and different to where 